From Fullerton District Stadium, Fullerton College Media Services presents Hornet Football. It's another junior college encounter in the Mission Conference as tonight the Fullerton College Hornets meet the Riverside City College Tigers. And under the light of a silvery moon, a crowd gathering here at Fullerton District Stadium for what should be a dandy football game on a glorious night for football. It was a year ago that the Fullerton College Hornets were on their way to a national championship and Riverside tried to slow them down. A year later, the roles are reversed and we don't know exactly what will happen. Hi everybody, I'm Mark Helmer along with Bruce Newmark and we're happy that you could be with us on your local cable company for what should be a very interesting junior college football game for a lot of reasons. One of which is what happened to the Hornets a week ago. Bruce, we had a chance to go on the road with the uh, Hornets when they visited their arch rivals down in Santa Ana, the Rancho Santiago Dons, and needless to say things did not go well well they really weren't beaten although they were in the score badly they really weren't beaten badly all over the field all night it was four big plays only really one long drive all night was all that was sustained so if they can stop the big play tonight they have a good shot of coming back from that loss when Bruce is talking about big plays he means that between rushing plays and kickoff returns they had four plays of no less than 75 yards against the Hornets that's the Dons last week tonight they're coming in against a Fullerton or a Riverside team that Fullerton faces that is one known for the big play and may even be better than Rancho Santiago was. Well, they uh, Rancho Santiago scored on an 87-yard kickoff return, a 75 yards uh, from scrimmage, and tonight Coach Sherbeck says the key to this game is going to be to regroup, to come back, and to play disciplined football. That the big play can burn you, but if you play disciplined football, they can't beat you. Meanwhile, on the other side of the ball is Barry Myers the head coach of the Riverside City College Tigers. A few years ago, I had the good fortune to be a radio broadcaster for RCC's Tigers, and if you are not familiar with Barry's philosophy, it's very simple. The Tigers like to run the ball, and then they will run the ball, and then a little bit later on, they'll run the ball some more. Probably the one big difference now versus a few years ago, when they used to run the veer offense and hardly throw if ever, now they run the option offense, and if they want to throw the ball, they can. Their quarterback already this year, Randy Payne, has more than 1,200 yards passing, plus he's got 200 yards of his own on the ground. And that could be the big problem, Bruce. Well, the big problem, of course, is that they don't run the option at Fullerton College. So when you go into a week of practice trying to get ready for this, you've got to try to figure out how you prepare for what you're going to see that weekend in the Absolutely. other side of the game. The pass is effective because you're able to only pass when they only pass coming out of the option. And Coach Sherbeck says that what will happen is your defense gets squeezed in there, and all of a sudden what they'll do is they'll drop back, and they'll burn you by going deep to one of the corners because you're not ready for it. You've been somewhat lulled by that type of an offense. And yet the Hornets apparently had an unknown ace in the hole, somebody on their team that had done this before. Well, the difficulty is that when you come into a game like this where you're looking at an offense that you don't see, as Coach Sherbeck advised, that you don't do it in practice as well as they're going to do it tonight. They're going to be quicker at running the option. They're going to be a lot different angles and things like that. But Eric Robinson, the wide receiver, was a quarterback in high school, and he ran the option in high school. He was able to provide a dimension in practice that they wouldn't have ordinarily had. And that is going to be something that is going to be very important indeed to watch because uh, the Tigers come into this game averaging more than 400 yards in total offense per game. That's number four in the Mission Conference. However, there are those that actually say the Hornets may have an advantage. They come in tonight with a number three defense in the Mission Conference. The officials that will be trying to uh, keep a handle on all this are Lloyd Nixon, the referee. The field judge is Rich Cobb. The head linesman is Steve Smith. The back judge, Mark Eichelberger. And the umpire is Steve Grain. The Tigers come into tonight's ball game ranked number two, not only in Southern California, but in the entire state of California for that matter. The only team they trail, of course, are the El Camino College Warriors, who the Tartans, the Hornets that is, ran into earlier this year. Riverside, meanwhile, ranked in the state 18th and 9th in Southern California. Riverside City College coming in 8-0, 7-0 in the Mission Conference overall, and 3-0 in the Central Division. 
The Hornets, meanwhile, five and three for the 89 campaign, four and three in the Mission Conference, and two and one in the Central Conference, and yet if they won tonight, they would be back in the hunt as far as the division championship is concerned. It would really cause a, a log jam, although probably their hopes of a bowl game are a little bit iffy. If well, they beat this team, they'd be right back in the hunt. They beat this team, then they're four and one, so would this team, probably Rancho Santiago would be in the same place. The thing tonight's gonna be to get David Chisholm some time. David Chisholm is not the kind of quarterback that quickly drops back and looks and reads and goes. They, David Chisholm is an excellent passer. He's an efficient quarterback, but he needs three, four, five seconds to get the ball into the hands of the receiver. The charge tonight is for the offensive line to give David Chisholm the kind of time he had earlier in the season that he hasn't had in the last three or four games. And one of those games in particular was last week against Rancho Santiago, and you can be sure that Barry Meyer had spies in the stand. They run a 34 defense at Riverside, and I'm sure they will definitely try to put pressure on Chisholm, and if they can, that could make a difference, because the Dons got to Chisholm, fouled up his timing, and everything started to come apart at the seams. Well, Chisholm has a higher passing completion than Randy Payne at 59%. And there you see Barry Meyer walking up and down the sidelines in his 10th year at Riverside City College. And going back to David Chisholm, he's completed 59% of his passes for 1,720 yards coming into tonight to only 1,213 for Randy Payne. So even though Chisholm's had some problems with interception, he's thrown 14 on the season. When he gets the time, he's effective, he's efficient, he's a good quarterback. And one thing that Chisholm and Payne are both going to have to do is look down the gun barrel of the guys that are tied for the conference lead in pass interceptions. John Ramirez for Riverside, Orlando Robbins for Fullerton. We hope you'll sit back and enjoy NCAA Junior College Football on your local cable company as Fullerton College Media Services brings you the Hornets and the Tigers, and this one ought to be a street fight from the word go. The Tigers, as you may well imagine, in black and orange in the left of your screen, and the Hornets in the home blue and gold to the right. The kickoff to the Hornets. It will be taken back on the two-yard line for the Hornets by Joaquin Garcia. And Joaquin out and into the pile at about the 21-yard line. So a 19-yard kickoff return for Joaquin Garcia. And the Hornets will set sail from there. They'd won four in a row up until the Santiago game, and then things did not go well. There you get a look at the interior five for the Hornets. Tell you about the skill positions in a second. Chisholm looking for time. He's got it tonight, at least on that play. Down the field, wide open is the tight end. Rob Coons out to the 41-yard line. Gain of 20. That's a good play, and it's probably got a message behind it. Well, I'll tell you, one of the messages was to Pete Tuasasopo by Matt Nicola. Tuasasopo was coming right at Chisholm. Chisholm was able to roll to the right, and Matt Nicola put a hit on him that kept him away from Chisholm and gave him time to throw that ball. Well, you saw it there a moment ago. Underwood, Nicola, Frembling, Hayes, and Wilford, the interior five for the Hornets. After this play, we'll try to show you the skill people if we can. You've already met one of them, the tight end Rob Coons, biggest guy on the team at 6'6". Chisholm, delay, or I should say play action, and we're going to see sack number one of the night right off the bat by Eric Alexander, who happens to be one of the uh, better tacklers on the entire Riverside team. He's already got 61 of them on the season, and now he's got a sack. They're going to have to pick that up. That's the kind of thing that they can't have happen to Chisholm tonight because Chisholm needs to get his rhythm. The whole team really needs to get their rhythm and get back on track. There you see the defensive set. This is the linebackers and some of the deep people. You've got Steve Stokes, Mike Harrington, Brian Dodson, and Kenny Deemer, the linebackers. You saw two of the deep people there. Up front, it's Harper, Tuiasa Sopo, and Alexander. And then Wade Smith, John Ramirez, Scott Elmore, and Fred Easter back deep. They were at the 40-yard line, and they've backed it up from there to the 10. So loss of 10 on the sack by Chisholm. Second and 20, and he's going to throw the ball for more than 20, and it's going to go out of bounds. Yeah, he wasn't throwing that to anybody. He was throwing that away so he didn't have to eat it. The pass rush came in immediately. They read the pass. He read the pressure, and he was done. The philosophical intended receiver, that means the guy that was in the same area code at least, was Mike Thomas, and he just kind of stood there and watched the ball fly on by. What that leaves the Hornets with now is a third and 20 from their own 30-yard line. 
going to have to start cranking in on this on this offensive line. They've got to block him, and they're having trouble. That def defensive line, Eric Alexander at 225, Tuiasa Sopo at 265, and then Will Harper at 235. You come behind that, your linebackers are all over 205 pounds. Chisholm sets a man in motion. That's Tony Goulet heading up the screen. Delay handoff to the main running back for the Hornets, Jeff Andrews. Andrews, of course, has already set the single season rushing record, the career rushing record, and just about every other thing you can imagine with the ball for the Fullerton College Hornets. He moved the ball from the 30 to the 33. They'll give him credit for three on that. And it'll bring up a fourth and 17 from the Hornets 33 yard line. Missing tonight is Kevin Leone. And punting tonight, Eric Lang, who normally does the place kicking, and that looked a little bit like a shanked field goal attempt right there, but it gets a good roll. And the ball will move from the Hornets' 37-yard line down to the 26. That'll make it a 37-yard punt for yard punt for Eric Lang. Here's the starting offensive set for the Riverside City College Tigers. Joe Tuano at the tight end spot. The wide receivers, Lyman, Lyman that is, and Ron Williams. I'll give you the other people in a moment. First and 10 from the 26. The ball up the middle to James Johnson. Okay, you see it's Cameron Lyman, Ron Williams, McChristian, the conference leader in rushing, Johnson and the quarterback, Payne. Mark, the offensive line here presents a big challenge for the Fullerton team. They average 263 pounds out there, and this is going to be a tough night for that defense. There was eight yards gained on that last play by Johnson. Second and two from the 34-yard line and moving up the middle that time. I believe it was Bell. No. no, I'm sorry, it was James Johnson carried the ball. Here you see the defensive set for the Hornets, Venturelli, Adams, and Caps. Kenny Bell in there defensively. And here you see Lavia Malingas, Palmer McGuire, Robbins, and Knapper, the deep set. It'll be third and a yard, give the ball right up the middle. And we're gonna wait for the official word, but it looks like the Tigers have the first down with ease as the ball moves from the 35 yard line out to nearly the 39. It was a third and one play and it looks like they got four that time without any problem at all. First and 10 now for the Tigers. At the Riverside, well, they're going to spot it back at the 39. Between the 38 and 39, it does vary a little bit depending upon which official sees what. Payne with the ball himself, he'll make it to the 40, and that's all he's going to get. Knocked down by Dante Venturelli, and also in there was Ward Van Pelt. Both of the defensive ends closing in and, and bringing Payne down in a hurry. It was a good read by the defense. I think they they tried to make it look like the ball was going to go to the running back. They went with a double tight end, and then Randy Payne kept the ball, tried to go over the middle, but Venerelli stopped it. Before that, Payne had 81 rushes for 205 yards, a 2.5-yard average, which is not bad for a quarterback. Six TDs, but he's got one that went for 41 yards for a touchdown. So they call it the option offense, and Payne, you see there, keeping it again, moving it from... 40 to the 45, so it'll be third and four. And of course, we already mentioned that one thing that may differ from the Riverside teams of a few years ago, when they were almost exclusively running, is that now they can throw the ball if they want to, and this may be a chance where they might need to. We're coming up 10 minutes exactly in the first quarter, third and five from their own 44, split backs, tight end to the top of the screen, one wide out down here, actually double tight ends. 
Pitch the ball back, and it goes to Daryl Christensen, who leads the conference in rushing. Daryl McChristian, I'm sorry. 5'10", 180-pound sophomore out of Eisenhower. It's a nice pitch back. It was a long wait for it, though. I'll tell you, it looked like Payne was going to try to pick it up himself, rounding laterally, and then the pitch out to Daryl McChristian, and he picked up the first down. Now, McChristian is both a rusher and a passer, and there's somebody who's going to be watching tonight, the Hornets head coach, Hal Sherbick. McChristian comes in tonight, 164 carries, 1,285 yards. That leads the conference a 7.8 average per carry, nine TDs to go along with it. And we're going to be seeing McChristian do this all night long. He only needs 141 yards tonight, Bruce, to become the all-time single-season rushing record holder for the Tigers. Well, that time he only got one. The defense did an excellent job. And Fullerton defense so far has done a pretty good job on that run. Well, they've got a read, and they're giving away a lot of weight. You know, the Hornets' uh, biggest guy up in the front normally is Mitch Meyer at 250. The smallest offensive lineman for the Tigers is 250. And they go from there to 260, 275, 280, and on down the road. That was McChristian again, dragged out of bounds this time by the right cornerback, Eddie Knapper. The line of scrimmage was the 49, it's now the 45. So you can give four more to Christian, McChristian that is. And it'll bring up another third and five situation. And the nice thing for the Tigers here is with the power of their offensive scheme overall, they can do just about whatever they want. We mentioned they average 410 yards a game. Offensively, 150, one of that per game passing, and then, of course, 258 on the ground. So the odds lean in the favor of the run, and as soon as we say that, they throw the ball. And they throw it right into the face of Ron Williams. Ken Palm, Kevin Palmer on the stop. He prevented that by keeping his heavy pressure there. And Fullerton read that because Kevin Palmer had just come in on that down. Well, Palmer may not have been... Uh, fully aligned to the fact the ball was coming to him. It hit him right smack in the face mask and fell to the turf. Fourth and five, and it should be Darren Goodman on to punt for the Tigers, a 5'11", 170-pound sophomore out of Cajon High School. Only a 34-yard average, but he has got one that went for 50 yards. Line of scrimmage, the 45 of the Hornets. He gets it away. Ball taken by Nick John Hadick back near his 11-yard line, and they'll knock him out of bounds there. So it's going to be about a 34-yard punt and little or no return. The A announcer says 33 yards, but you get the idea. 9.05 in the first quarter showing on the scoreboard clock. And there's no score on the scoreboard at this point. Hornets will set sail again on their second series of the night. First and 10 from the Hornet 12-yard line. So I suppose you could more or less give Haydick credit for a one-yard punt return. Chisholm will set the line, first and 10. Strong to the left side, pitch to Jeff Andrews, far side of the field. And he'll step out of bounds near the 15-yard line. Gain of about three yards on that, and it should bring up a second and seven. Andrews tonight through eight ball games, coming in rushing. 141 carries, 722 yards, a 5.1 average, and eight touchdowns. Second and seven from the, make it second and six from the Hornets 16 yard line, so they'll give them credit for nearly four yards on that. Single setback this time. Thomas split out wide to the near side of the field, but he goes to the top of the field to Tony Goulet, the fullback. And the pass is completed, Bruce, just beyond the 25-yard line market near the 26. A gain of 10. There's a real good example of what Chisholm can do when you give him four or five seconds. It's the first time, really, beyond, besides the first pass completion that he had, that he had a full four or five seconds. And that time, he hung right in there. He had the time. He put the ball on the outside of Tony Goulet, right in his hands. He was able to turn up field and pick up a little more. And I think what the NFL textbook says four seconds is great. Usually, you have to live with three, but that is something he did not have against a very good Rancho Santiago team last week. This is Goulet again on the ground this time, and Goulet will move it from the 26-yard line out to about maybe the 27. The reason he didn't get more is he ran into Mike Harrigan, and Harrington, that is, uh, 
six foot, 205 pound sophomore from Arlington High School, leads the Mission Conference in tackles. That was tackle number 82. He had a mere 19 of them against Cerritos. Say what, he went under him like a submarine. As he was coming across the line, Harrington went down to the turf, and all he found was the legs of the runner. Second and nine. From the 27-yard line, Chisholm may be audibilizing. He sets Mike Thomas in motion. Seven-step drop back. He's got plenty of time down the middle, and he completes it. And it should be Richard Nelson, the backup tight end, advancing the ball to, according to one official, the 32-yard line. The other one says the 31. And the 32-yard line official prevails, so that'll be good for about five yards that time to Richard Nelson. Nelson coming in tonight, he had 17 receptions and he's one of four pass receivers for the Hornets that's averaging in double figures. Actually, there's more than that. And we'll tell you more about that later on. I think the tally now, he's among the, the top four as far as use, but there's something like 12 guys in double figures. There is another pass completion. I think that time it was either Nelson or Coons. It was a third and four play. And it will be Nelson again from the 32. This time they'll spot it at the 35, so give him credit for three more. And that'll bring up a fourth and a yard from the Hornet 35-yard line. Dropping back deep for the Tigers to return it, Mario McCullough and also Will Martin. Again, the place kicker, Eric Lang, replacing Kevin Leone punting tonight. Takes the snap gets it away. This time he got a good one. Backpedaling all the way to the 17 yard line and then falling down is Will Martin. And there is a flag on the play, so hold everything. It was a 48 yard punt that time. Bruce, you got the story on why Leon wasn't being used. Was it an injury? It's an injury. He won't be in tonight because he's got a bruised calf. And in a punter, that's something that's going to keep you out of the game. 48-yard punt, three-yard return. And we're waiting to find out what the story is on the flag. Now, we're... Dead ball foul. Dead ball foul. Personal foul. Personal on foul. Riverside. The Half the distance to the goal line. First down and 20. Aren't referees wonderful? You ask questions and they answer them for you. So it's 10 yards, half the distance on the personal foul. By the way, if you were with us for our telecast not too long ago of the uh, Riverside City College Tigers and the Golden West Rustlers, we left you saying that we would find out the story of the alleged timeout that was charged against Hal Sherbick by the referee of that ball game. I'll give you that story in a minute, but it was between Fullerton and the Orange Coast Pirates. To okay, put a little drama into it, when we last left you, there was a controversy about whether or not the Fullerton coaching staff had called a timeout in a controversial, uh, unsportsmanlike conduct call on the sideline of Fullerton College. The actual story was Coach Sherbeck wanted a explanation of why that penalty was called. He walked out on the field to get a uh, explanation from the referee, and the referee assessed a timeout, a rule which nobody seems to know exists in college football. That was a second and 21 yard play that time for Riverside's Daryl McChristian. And there you see Barry Meyer with the headset on and he's pacing up and down the sidelines and you get the impression Barry's a very animated coach. If, if things do not go according to the rule book or the playbook he issued in August, uh, you may see reactions like that. The ball was on the nine yard line previous to McChristian's run, line of scrimmage now about the 13, so he got about four on that one, and yes, the Tigers can pass, and there might be an interference flag on that Absolutely. one. You can see it coming 10 yards ago. No doubt about it. Kevin Palmer ran down number 14, Ron Williams. Ron Williams turned to go to the ball. Kevin Palmer was behind him. He didn't look back at the pass. He didn't look back at the ball, and he just ran him over. I think what happened, Bruce, is he ran into Williams' legs, and then that caused him to fall forward, but it doesn't make any difference. That was uh, textbook pass interference. Well, what a happened? Call by the officials. What the officials saw. Yep. 
interference on the defense, automatic first down. Thank you. So the line of scrimmage will be moved up to the 27 yard line from the 13. And the Tigers will move from there on the pass interference charge against the Hornets. Fumble ball, bad snap. They're gonna lose a little. Looks like Payne got the problem back himself. Not sure whether it was Payne or one of his offensive line. Payne Mike fell Edge. on the ball, it was a bad snap. He didn't get the handle on the ball and when he knew he lost it, he went down right immediately on the ball, but he's gonna lose four yards. So the move from the 27 yard line, well actually, Take a look, Back there the you see Payne fall on the, pat, on the bad snap himself. They just didn't make a connection. 5.09 and counting down in the first quarter, split backs, double tight end set. And Payne calling out the signals. Fakes to one back, fakes to the other, and gets sacked in the backfield by Dante Venturelli. But in there first was number 27 for Fullerton, Kevin Caps. Caps went in, rattled him, and then Venturelli came in and took him down. They tried to fake the handoff. They went for the option, and it didn't, fa it didn't even phase the Hornets. They knew exactly what was going to happen, read it all the way, and took him out. Ball is back to the 18-yard line, so it'll be a loss of six on the uh, sack of Payne. Brings up a third and 19. On that fumble, that's something we want to look at later on the game for Fullerton. They may have an opportunity for that to happen later on too. Gene Shute, their long snapper, is out tonight with a hyperextended knee. So that's something they're going to have to guard against later on. Payne getting ready to take the snap, and there's a whistle before they get started. And it's called, caused, that is, by a timeout by the Hornets. If any traditions continue in the Inland Empire from the past, that's one thing that used to be a major problem for the Tigers in the days when they used to run the Veer offense. A lot of action by the line and they were very susceptible to the fumble. Well, that time, not only did they have a fumble, they also had a sack on that drive. And they, with a penalty, they lost a lot of yards. This is the standings in the central division of the Mission Conference. It works a lot like one of the conferences in the NFL. There's three different divisions. South is basically down in the San Diego, central Orange County, if you will, and north uh, the Los Angeles and uh, San Gabriel Valley area. And there you see it, Riverside 8-0, 7-0. And Rancho Santiago, boy, that was a big loss, Bruce, suffered last week. Very, very, very big. Seven and one there, six and one, and then Fullerton, five and three, four and three. Now, what it doesn't show you there is the standings within the division itself as far as other division games. If the Hornets could pull this off tonight, they would go back to two, make it three and one in the conference, and that would make or three and one within the central division, and that would really... Uh, mess things up in a big way as far as figuring out who does what to who next because Orange Coast College is not that far behind and uh, it would also slow the Tigers down in a big way as well. Third and 19 from the 18, Payne wants to throw and he will. This time right through the hands of Ron Williams who came into this game with two touchdowns and a 19.4 yard per reception average. That time Kevin Palmer got a little help from Orlando Robbins, Palmer playing behind him, Robbins playing in front of him, and Ron Williams just couldn't accelerate to get to the ball because right there was Orlando Robbins. So the pass looked like it was overthrown. We talked about the Hornets having like 12 guys with double figure passing reception averages. The same is true for Riverside, only two guys, but the numbers are amazing. There's gonna be an amazing punt. Nick John Hadick taking it back at his own 30. There's a flag on the return. It's got to be a clip. And that was a 52-yard punt before Hadick ever saw it. Well, on that Riverside last possession mark, they had the ball for two minutes and 14 seconds and lost three yards during the possession. Say that one more time. They had the ball for two minutes and 14 seconds and lost three yards during the possession. 
needless to say, it, the Hornets are slowing down the bus. So that's, you expected to see a dynamic running game from the Riverside Tigers tonight. So far, they've done an excellent job of shutting that down. And on the long pass, it comes off, you know, being able to run the pass off the option. Okay. They've stopped that on too. The return. First down and 10. Well, Nick John Haydick got the ball, Bruce, at the Hornets 30 yard line. Then he lost six yards and they clipped as well. So the way it looks at this point at 356 of the first is that they lost 15 yards approximately on the clipping of the return. And they will start now first and 10 from their own 14 yard line. The man with the ball, you've seen him before, Jeff Andrews. He's across, I believe, the 17-yard line. They'll spot him actually close to the 18, so they'll give him f credit for four on that, second and six at the Hornet 18-yard line. No score, three minutes and 35 seconds left in the first quarter. Mark Kilmer along with Bruce Newmark and our Fullerton College Media Services sports crew. Glad that you could join us for some junior college football, a game that, frankly, after what we saw a week ago at Santiago, when the Hornets played the Dons, we expected could have been a brutal ball game. And yet, as we mentioned in the pregame activity, it was really four plays that destroyed the Hornets. Other than that, there was really only one long sustained drive of the night. And the Hornets lost 35 to 10. Mike Thomas, the receiver on that play, his first reception of the night. Now move the ball from the 18 yard line, more than 10 yards. The sticks are moving, he got a first down. Sure did, he did a great, it was a great fake to Jeff Andrews. It caught the Riverside team looking. The ball goes to Mike Thomas and they get a first down. Well, the line of scrimmage originally had been the 14 yard line. Now it sits at the 25. It was a gain of seven on that play by Thomas. And first and 10 for the Hornets from there. Chisholm doing a good job of moving this offense early in this quarter. And the offensive line of Underwood, Nicola, Frembling, Hayes, and Wilford doing an outstanding job of giving him time. Hadick in motion. If, if Chisholm's got time, that may be all he needs. Because when you can give the ball to that guy and throw to the core receivers they've got, frankly, Bruce, so far this is not the game we expected. Well, it may be the game that we should have expected. Talking to Coach Hal Sherbeck in the pregame, there's one thing about Coach Sherbeck we've learned. When you ask him a question, he says, well, maybe if, if, if. Usually the ifs are what's going to happen. He said the charge tonight was of the offensive line to be able not only to protect Chisholm, but in the cases where they run the ball to open holes for Jeff Andrews. You've seen the time he's gotten, that Chisholm's gotten. There you saw a hole opened for Jeff Andrews. Second and three on the seven-yard gain by Andrews. You don't get to be the winningest coach in J.C. football if you can't come back after a tough loss. Andrews comes right back into the, the fray on that one, moves the ball from the 32 to the 34-yard line. So he gets two of the three that they needed, and it should bring up a third and one from the Hornets' 34-yard line. 2.05 in the first quarter, no score. And these are teams that... Uh, well, before we get to that, we gave you those numbers a little bit earlier. The important thing for Andrews and for the running backs of Riverside is the average per carry. Anytime you're over five yards, you're doing something. The Hornets come in here scoring-wise, averaging 20, nearly 29 points a ball game. Riverside over 30. And so far, nobody's done a thing. I nobody's going to do anything on that play because there's a flag. I yeah, I think there's a hold on the offensive line. Andrews was the ball carrier, but don't add this one to his lifetime career rushing totals yet. I have a feeling they're going to bring it back. Nice run. He ran up a hole on the left side. And I have a feeling the hole was on the left side. Motion. Call in motion. Well, that's only five instead of ten. I think they'll take it. So scratch the third and one. They lose five on the motion penalty. And it's third and six from what will be the Hornet 29. Well, so far, Fullerton with 34 yards and penalties already in the first quarter. These are things we've been watching during the course of the season. Fullerton's had a little bit of problems with penalties. Tonight already, 34 yards. Well, not compared to, of course, last year, that was one thing that... Uh, really cut into the Hornet team then, but they were so good a year ago that they could actually get away with more than 100 yards and penalties per ball game. This team, a younger squad than a year ago, might not be able to do that, but they have uh, improved it somewhat from the 88 season. Nice pass from Chisholm to his big tight end, Rob Coons. 
This is a big target at 6'6", 235, but this one may also be just for looks because there's a flag on the far side of the field by the head linesman, and the direction the Hornets are walking in would indicate a problem again. Guess what? Motion one more time. Yeah, now, see, that's the thing Coach Sherbeck was so concerned about. He said that in order to beat a good team and in order to not have a repeat of last week, you've got to be a disciplined ball team. They're a good Illegal example. Illegal motion on the offense, still third down. There's a good example on two succeeding downs of a lack of discipline. You can expect to see a holding penalty periodically at any time of the year, but I think any reputable football coach will tell you that when you're in the ninth game of the season, a motion penalty is just not something you need. Well, especially with holding, a lot of times holding, you got to hold because a guy gets past you because you get physically beaten. The only way to keep your quarterback alive maybe is holding between losing your quarterback and a sack and getting a holding penalty. Sometimes you're better off taking the hold. Third and 11 now back on the 24. Chisholm looking downfield. He's got a variety of receivers to throw to. One of them that almost became the receiver was Mike Harrington, the inside linebacker for the Tigers, and that was not by design either. So we end up with fourth and 11, and the Hornets are moving the ball consistently in consistently the wrong direction. That was not a terrific drive for him, and as you said, a gain, uh, actually a loss on that possession of one well, yard. Well, while they loss. set up this punt, this is a summary of penalties for the Hornets in 89. Well, I will let them do, kick the ball first, and then we'll get back to that, but that has been somewhat of a problem. Eric Lang gets it away this time. Line of scrimmage was his own 24. The ball will be taken right at the 45, and immediately Will Martin gets the Fullerton Howdy, and he will go nowhere. The punt was 31 yards. There you see the penalty statistics during 1989. Hornets 67 penalties, 732 yards against an opponent's 51 penalties for 443. And that's significant because that's the kind of discipline errors that Coach Sherbeck is so concerned about coming into tonight. 19 seconds showing on the clock in the first quarter. Riverside setting sail after a minus one yard punt return. And they'll get going from their own 44 yard line. Payne give the ball to the first man to the line. No, he didn't. A great belly fake and pitches it back to Darrell McChristian. Bubble. The ball is fumbled. He's thrown to the field. It's recovered by Keone Malingas. But did the ground cause the fumble no. or not? And the player that fumbled is injured, and I have seen no indication that they're giving the ball to the Hornets. I can't believe the ground caused the fumble because as he was thrown, it looked to me like he lost the ball prior to the time. That could be critical for Riverside. Well, Darryl McChristian is out of this game or hurt. Well, he's the one that took the ball, frankly, and that is another example of Barry I don't know Meyer. if we've got it on replay or not. We might be able to, let's take a look at it, but he was slammed, and it appeared to me he lost the ball as he was thrown toward the ground. There's the there, great take belly a look right here. He's, he loses, he, well, I don't know. His I hand may have, his hand may have, his hand may have lost the ball before the ground, but boy, he was slammed to the ground by Eddie Knapper. Well, anyway, what I started to say, there was another example of a Barry Meyer coach team. They have great action in the line, a belly series, and you saw a great fake there to James Johnson, which froze the linebackers, and then McChristian took the pitch, and he had the ball in his left hand like a loaf of bread, and it came out when he hit the ground, and they were going to say that it was the ground that caused the fumble, right or wrong. When play can continues it will be second and eight as that is the end of the first quarter the Hornets and the Tigers no score so far I was really surprised I'll tell you on the replay I agree with it it was a tough call whether the ground caused the fumble or whether he lost the ball going down when I first saw it I thought that he had lost the ball on the way to the ground that in in, in flight, I guess, is what I'm trying to say, that he went and lost the ball. But no, I agree. The ground caused the fumble. Malingus, though, heads up, was right on that ball. Had it been uh, a fumble, he would have owed it to him to come up with that ball because there were Tigers all over the area. And there were Hornets in the neighborhood, too, but uh, they'll give it back to the guys in the black and the orange. Seems only right that a Tiger should wear those colors. And it's second and a long eight, if you will, from the 45. Pain to throw off the hands of the tight end, Joe Dantuno, I believe is how he Dan pronounced Dantuono. 
Let's try Dan Tuono. I think Dan that's Tuono, really I it. Think Dan, you're Joe Dan right. Tuono. But coverage. <laughs> sorry about that. That's coverage right. by uh, we'll do better Lord with Van Pelt. That's a much easier name to say. Yeah, I went for that one. That was the one I was taking. Dan, Joe Dan Tuono, a 6'2", 215-pound sophomore from Norco, despite what I just said. One thing to look at, though, on that last, we thought almost a fumble, but it wasn't. What could be critical was the fact that Daryl McChristian's not in the ball game right now. No, he's not. Different running backs in the backfield. Tell you about that in a second. Meanwhile, Payne unloads it and gets popped right in the stomach by Dante Venturelli the minute he throws the ball. The intended receiver was Ron Williams, and he was out of bounds. So what may be of more note, and Bruce, you're keeping a tally on drives, the Hornets have shut down the Tigers big time on that drive as well. Fourth and eight from the Riverside 46-yard line. Well, on the last two possessions, they were negative three on the first. On the second possession, they were negative three on that one. They picked up one total yard during the course of the drive that ban began back 19 seconds in the first to go in the this first quarter. This is a team that averages 410 yards per game. Excellent job wow. shutting down the run. Nick John Hadick backpedaling at the eight. I don't know if I would have gotten uh -oh. near this ball, uh -oh. but he's got uh -oh. a lane. Hadick, the track man, back to the 34 and knocked up in the air then by Riverside's Donnie Markham, or he would have been long gone. I Absolutely. was just about to say. I, I said, uh-oh, because he made, he found a seam along the right side of that field. He made that cut up at the 40-yard line, or the 30, uh, 34 yard line, and had Markham not stopped him, he was going for six points. Take a look at this. It was a 46-yard. It was a 46-yard punt, and the, the book says you don't get near the ball inside the 10. But Take a look at this. He actually has to drop back three or four yards, and he waits for that one block right there. Finds a seam along the left side, cuts up, makes a cut, and bang! That's the touchdown saver right there. 14-34 left in the first half. Hornets setting sail from their own 34. Jeff Andrews of the block, and he'll move it up to the 40-yard line. Gain of six on that one. Somebody down for the Riverside team, and he looks like he is in obvious pain. We'll try to find out who that is in a moment. Going back to that last drive, the other thing that happened was the Tigers only held the ball for 30 seconds. It began back 19 seconds in the first quarter. They gave the ball up with 14.49 to go in the second quarter, and all of a sudden, the Hornets go back on the field offensively, and the Tigers' defense forced to come back out. While they have that injured player to recap, that was a 46-yard punt by uh, Darren Goodman, and what was a very risky but very exciting 26 six-yard punt return by Nick John Hadick. The injured player for Riverside was Mike Harrington. Uh -oh. Wow, you don't want to I'm lose gonna him. I'm going to tell you what, Fullerton's keying on the guys that they need the most. McChristian went out on their last possession, now one of their best defensive linebackers goes out, at least on this series. This could be tough times for Tigers if they don't get these guys back. A gain of four on that play, I believe it was by Andrews. Excuse me, a loss of a little bit on that one, so it's back to the 39. That'll make it third and five from the Hornets' 39-yard line. Chisholm to pass, man wide open. It's Haydick at the 45 of the Tigers, and this down is inside going the 42, the 38. There's a flag on the field, and I'm afraid this may be called back, and if so, that's going to be a shame. The flag is apparently going to be against Riverside. Offside, defense, penalty declined. Penalty will be First declined. Down. I said uh, that it was third and five. My apologies on that. It was second and five. The pass play from the 39-yard line moves it down to the 39, basically, of Riverside. It's a gain of 21 yards. Nick John Hadick. Now it's first and 10 for the Hornets at the Riverside 38 yard line. Chisholm rolling to his left, escapes one tackle momentarily and dragged down by Kenny Deemer, the, one of the outside linebackers for the Tigers. But not until the ball is moved, the blazing total of one yard on that one. That last penalty costly for the Tigers because without that. Well, they, they made the, They made it anyway. They picked up the 21 yards, but boy. 
Mike Harrington was the player that went out a moment ago. You saw briefly a graphic on the screen of our upcoming game. We were sorry we didn't get to say anything about that, but we had we had the leading tackler in the conference going down in the and dirt. And he's not back yet. He's not back yet. That could make a big difference in this ball game. 12:42 remaining in the first half. No score, but the Hornets trying to do something about that as they pitch it back to Jeff Andrews, and he'll tippy toe out of bounds at the 40-yard line. And that actually is going to be a loss of nearly three yards for Andrews on that. It'll bring up a third and 12 from the Tiger 40-yard line. So you're dealing with two teams here, one that was the runner-up for the national championship last year, another team that might be this year. They may be a better team than El Camino, who is in leading the hunt right now. And here we are. We're about 20 minutes clockwise into the ball game. One team that averages 410 yards a ball game, the other one 373. The two of them together, collectively, we expected about a 60-point ball game, and we've got goose eggs on the scoreboard. Chisholm backpedals, looks downfield. He's got a man wide open, and I think it's Thomas. Touchdown. No. It was Chuck Wilford. Wilford was the man on the far side of the field. They put Thomas in the slot position. Wilford went wide left. Wilford went for the roses, but it just slipped through his fingers. You notice I said touchdown. It was in and out of the hands of Chuck Wilford. Unbelievable. He did all he could. Chisholm there showed just what a great arm he had. He actually overthrew him. Wilford doing all he could to accelerate to get into the end zone. Take a look, Wilford White. You see Thomas there mo in motion. He's uh, he was down in the, the slot. There's Wilford on another play. It's again that trick play that we saw. It's again the trick play that we saw in the Orange Coast game. Stepping onto the field for the Hornets that time was Kevin Thomas, penalty flag. So they're going to bring it back. It's the same play we saw a couple weeks ago where Thomas apparently just kind of steps on the field from the sidelines, and the pass is made to him. But unfortunately, this time, we've got unsportsmanlike conduct against the Hornets, and it's all for naught. Let's see if we can pick up how this happened again. They tried this in our last telecast, and it caught the, the Pirates napping. Dead ball, unsportsmanlike, first down and 25. So they will get credit for the play, however. The line of scrimmage now will be the 33-yard line. And it'll be first and first and 25 at the Tigers 33-yard line. Again, these are all discipline penalties, and they're discipline penalties that are costing them big. They're 15-yard. Boy, those hurt. Which means they would have made it down to the 18-yard line in the pass play, which would have made it a 22-yard gain. And then you lose 15 on the penalty. Timeout called on the field. Second timeout taken by the Hornets. They have one remaining. And what we were trying to tell you a few moments ago before things started coming apart at the seams, that the next home game for the Fullerton College Hornets a week from now will be against the Gauchos of Saddleback. And they're a team that historically is very, very good. They are almost a football factory. And for those that may not know, from the neck down, their uniforms are identical to USC's. They have a helmet that looks exactly like the Green Bay Packers, except it's cardinal in gold. And Ken Swearigan has been winning football games down there for 20 years. And yet, 1989 has been, to be very honest, a disaster for the Gauchos. They normally are among the winningest teams in the state and nothing would be finer as the saying goes for the Hornets if they could pull this one off and blow the Gauchos away they might have a bowl game in their future a seven and three record just might get it done so we resume after the timeout first and 25 from the Tiger 33. It'll be an uh, end around, if you will, by Mike Thomas. He will stop. He will throw. Hadick in the end zone. Knocked away. Unbelievable. They went right back to it again, figuring nobody would be looking for it twice. And that time, excellent defensive coverage. John Ramirez and Kenny Deemer there on Hadick. 
Uh, unable to pick up that pass. A year ago, when the Hornets were on their way to what they thought was a national championship, they almost lost that ball game. And the way they pulled out the victory a year ago, 19-15 to against Riverside, was on a double pass play from the quarterback to one of the running backs to Nick John Hadick. It worked in 1988, not yet in 1989. 12.08 left in the half. No score. Can you believe it? Second and 25. Thomas in motion. Chisholm, who has had all the time he ever needed, and he's got more now. Down the middle, it's Thomas. And this time, the pass is complete at the 17-yard line. Well, Gain they need, of 16. Well, they, need, they needed that because that gets them down to where the original line of scrimmage would have been had they not had the penalty. So they'll go third and about 10. There you see, right over the middle to Richard Thomas. And again, a lot of time. He, six, seven seconds that time. He had all the time in the world. Great job of coverage by the offensive line. Third and nine at the Tigers' 17-yard line. Chisholm sets his line strong to the right side. The big guy, Rob Coons, back in at tight end. Double wideouts to the top. Goulet, the only back. They'll go to the left. It's in and out of the hands again of Chuck Wilford. That's two passes as Wilford's dropped tonight so far. Brian Dodson, I believe it was, one of the linebackers defending for Riverside. We should tell you about the defensive set for Riverside. Will Harper, Pete Tui, Asasopo, and Eric Alexander up in the front, 235, 265, and 225. Then Steve Stokes, Mike Harrington, Brian Dodson, and Kenny Deemer. A very good linebacking core, all at around 200. And size and weight-wise in the back, the pass defense for the Tigers, not that big. This will be a 34-yard field goal attempt by Eric Lang. The snap is back, the ball is down, it's nearly blocked, but it will not be blocked, and it will be good at the 11-11 mark of the second quarter. It was very nearly blocked by Eric Williams, who came flying across it. He got it off just in time, and there's your first score of the night. By our count, nine plays. 66 yards, 3 minutes and 23 seconds, and the 34-yard field goal by Eric Lang. Lang kicking on the season so far. Well, we had that note on him here somewhere. I'll find out where we put it in a moment. But as far as his scoring goes, that will take Lang up to 66 points. And he's now 13 of 17 in field goals for the season. And the Hornets lead 3 to nothing. And who would have believed when these two teams came together that you would end up with a 3 to nothing score with nearly 20 minutes of regulation play expired so far. In a way, it really helps the Hornets if the score is lower. They have the better scoring average. From the 11-yard line, bringing it back for the Tigers is Will Martin. From the 11 out to about the 33. So it'll be a 22-yard return for Martin. Those are the kind of things that has got to get Coach Sherbeck's heart up in his throat because last week with that 87-yard uh, kickoff return, you don't want to see these guys running one back 22 yards. You don't want to see them running them back at all. Once they get that acceleration, it can be trouble. First and 10 for the Tigers going the other way. They would not want to go in the locker room trailing at all like this. I think they may be somewhat surprised. I am surprised at how easily they are being stopped. Now, here is an example of power versus finesse because on Daryl McChristian's rush that time from the 32-33 yard line, he moves it out to the 35. His offensive line averages 263 pounds, and Mitch Meyer is the biggest guy in the defensive set for the Hornets at only 250. And of course, now it's key that Daryl McChristian is back in this ball game for the Tigers. Call it a second and eight from the Tigers' 35 yard line, 10 and a half left in the half. Moving up a little bit closer, Ward Van Pelt, they got him in at a linebacker spot this time. Give the ball off this time 
to Mark Wilson, a freshman running back out of El Dorado High School in Nevada. And I believe it was Mike DeClark in there to make the stop this time. Sure was. Mike DeClark came straight across that line and got Wilson. And just an excellent job stopping the run. Not what we expected to see at all. We thought the run would play, give some fits to the defensive line because of the offensive line size and the holes that they could open. But so far, man for man, the Fullerton team doing an excellent job. Third and eight inside of 10 minutes now, remaining in the first half. Double wideouts to the far side of the field. Double tight ends and double running backs. And they'll go to... The right side to Cameron Lyman. Now this is a guy, we told you earlier about Ron Williams' pass per catch average of 19.4. How about this one for Cameron Lyman? 17 receptions, 471 yards, 27.7 yards per catch. And a big one right there. They got everybody looking. It appeared that uh, the ball was being run through the line by Daryl McChristian and Payne did a great job of holding onto that ball, making it look like McChristian already had it, and then throwing to Lyman. Lyman only got 16 on that one. Payne in a rolling pocket. He's got one blocker and two guys chasing him, and down he'll go at the 49-yard line. Bumble. Ball's loose, but I don't think it's going to stand. Wait a minute, though. No indication from the officials. All right, the head linesman says it's going to stay Tiger ball. And I think the guy making the tackle that time for Riverside, I was going to say it first I thought it was uh, Venturelli, but it looks like it was Kenny Bell. So Payne will be considered the ball carrier for a loss of two, and it'll bring up a second and 12 from the Tiger 49. Not to mention the fact that the natives in the Fullerton stands got restless on that call. They felt that ball should have been Fullerton's, but as you said, the ground can't cause a fumble. And I think they're, they're, they're gonna cheering give it back from their Tigers. heart on that one. Split backfield, double tight ends again, one wide out to the near side of the field. And Payne will pitch back to McChristian. Off the right side, Hornets in hot pursuit, and they'll drag him down by the time he reaches the Hornet 43-yard line, so a gain of eight that time by McChristian. It'll be a third and four play now after that eight-yard gain at the Hornets 43-yard line, pass to the near side of the field to Joe Dan Tuono. We got it right that time. And he was stopped. I'm going to take the easy way out by Eddie Knapper. Knapper stopped him, and he made a reception, but he did pick up the first down. Twelve yards on that play. And it'll give the Tigers another first down. This one at the Hornets' 37-yard line. Excuse me, gain of four on that pass play. Now it's first and 10 from the 37. Man with the ball is Mark Wilson, fellow we told you about from the high school in Nevada that has the same name as the high school in Orange County, El Dorado. And Wilson on this carry got possibly a yard and not much more. He ran a lot of real estate to pick up the yard too. He must have run 12, 15 yards. And this now at the uh, 36 yard line of the Fullerton Hornets is the deepest that either team has been into the other territory other than the field goal. So this is the first time Riverside's been able to penetrate into Fullerton territory. And the field goal, of course, was 34 yards, kicked from the 17, so that was the closest anybody's got to really doing it. There you see a great spin move by Payne and in some sort of quick opener type of blocking scheme. Up the middle goes Daryl McChristian, and just like that, moves it from the 36-yard line down inside the 25 to the 24. Well, you know, there's a few things. It's It's been probably five, six, seven years since we had an opportunity in person to see the Tigers from our old radio days out there with them. But even though the play scheme is different, there are certain trademarks that Barry Meyer is known for, and that's another one, is that quick little open play right up the middle. And... They can strike like lightning, and there you see the same type of thing again. 
He was running that play in his first year as head coach, and it's running it again. Up off the turf one more time, it's McChristian. This time, Mitch Meyer with the stop. I was gonna, well, no, I was going to say Mitch Meyer. I'm sorry, I pointed to Mitch Meyer for you, but what I was going to tell you was that Mitch Meyer came across there, and just as that handoff was being made, he made it like a slash block trying to go after uh, the ball, and he nearly knocked the ball out of Payne's hands. He just got it to Daryl McChristian. Well, it went from the 36 to the 25, and now it's down to the 14. Back-to-back 11-yard -back gains. And now it's first and 10 at the Hornet 14-yard line. This time, they get little or nothing. I believe it was Dante Venturelli making the stop. We'll have to wait till they unpile and unwind down there. One of the guys getting off the pile is Keone Malingus. And what happened was... Venerelli met him first, slowed him down, and then Malingus came in there and took him out. Virtually no gain that time, and I believe it was, uh, believe it was McChristian. The second and 10 for the Tigers at the Hornets 14 yard line. Five minutes and 20 seconds remaining in the first half, and it's only three to nothing. Hornets on top of the Tigers. They set another double tight end line again. This time Payne wants pay dirt through the air. And his receiver stopped at the goal line. The ball hit the ground eight yards in the end zone. Intended receiver, the guy with a 27 and a half yard average, Cameron Lyman. The thing that's so amazing is those in, those linebackers for the Hornets, they're like bookends. They both came out of the same high school and they are so fast. They're, they're, they're like the same player. They come up, they can meet the run right now. It's and they, unbelievable to and watch They them. are named Mahi Lavia and Keone Malingus. Try that three times in a hurry. Bookends. Both out of Western High School, and as Bruce said, very quick for linebackers. 5'11 on a stopped clock, double tight ends, split backs, and two wideouts over this away. Payne, fake it to one man, do it himself, and I think they're going to bring this one back because most of the team left before Payne snapped the ball. There's another flag, so it looks like we may have motion and an editorial reply as well. This could be offsetting penalties. Well, Mitch Meyer made the first contact with McChristian and slowed him down. Now, Payne is saying that it's against this man's team right here, Hal Sherbick waiting for the verdict from the court. And now kind of going over there to peek over their shoulder is Mahi Lavia. I could see possibly the third flag being against someone for Fullerton, but the other two, one was put on by the uh, head linesman and the other one by, I think, the field judge through the first two flags, so I thought we had motion for sure. Here's the whole story from referee Lloyd Nixon. Turn your switch on, Lloyd. Okay. Offsides on the defense. Dead ball, personal foul against the Hornets. So Five you, yards for the offsides and half the distance, automatic first down for the personal foul. So you end up with what would have been basically 20 yards in penalties from the 14. You're going to end up with a double foul, if you will, and it will be seven yards on offsides and a personal foul. And now you have first and goal for Riverside from the Hornet four yard line. Seven man front, Payne give it, and McChristian is met immediately at the line by Mitch Meyer. Also in there was Mike McGuire. And there's no gain on that one with 4.38 and the clock counting down. It'll be second and goal. Again, from the Hornets' four-yard line. Well, you hate to harp on anything, but they're an automatic first down, essentially given up because of a discipline, a lack of discipline on a scoring drive. Payne inside, man with the ball is Mark Wilson, and Mr. Wilson has himself a touchdown. the drive began way back on the Tigers' own 33-yard line and 67 yards later and a fair amount of time as well, which is going to come out to nearly a seven-minute drive. We'll give you the, the whole play total and everything in a moment while Darren Goodman comes in and tries the conversion. Fourteen plays, 67 yards, and six minutes and a whole bunch of seconds. 
Make it six minutes and 49 seconds. And suddenly it's RCC as they are known, seven, and Fullerton College three. That's a long sustained drive, six minutes and 49 seconds, 67 yards, and boy, that eats up on a defense. It eats up on a defense indeed. The, that's the, the downside of it. The positive side of it is that it took them that long to score against the Riverside defense as opposed to the big play like last week. That's what absolutely killed the Hornets in their game against the Dons. The other thing that hurts you, though, is you can't continue making those kinds of mental mistakes. The offsides penalty and then the unsportsmanlike conduct penalty. At the unsportsmanlike conduct penalty, a definite discipline mistake. The mental mistake on the offsides, and you don't do that when a team's on the 8-9 yard line going on the way to the touchdown. A year ago, it was more than 100 yards a game, and Bruce has mentioned it's been a problem for the Hornets up till now, but up to tonight, it hasn't been a big problem, but it looks like it may be getting bigger by the moment. And this is a team, number two in the state, where you simply cannot do that. Of course, the Tigers with that big uh, cat paw on the side of the helmet, reminiscent of the, the Tigers of Clemson. And they kick the ball off to the Hornets down the field and taking it. And we got another flag. That may be Nick that John Hadick took it out of bounds at the 14. Now, did he catch be, the ball out of bounds yeah, or did I the think, kick go out of bounds? I think he may have caught it out of bounds, and that may, they may be bringing that punt back. Well, uh, the kickoff, wait and see. Or the kickoff back, rather. See why there would be it. Well, if, if he caught it out of bounds, and that answers the question. They will bring it back and try point. it again. It will be offsides or procedure or whatever you want to call it. Referee Lloyd Nixon gives us both, which is actually true. I guess they did both things. They were offsides in the kick, plus the illegal procedure for kicking it out of bounds. So it'll be five yards. Quick stat on penalties now. 67 yards in penalties for the Hornets in this first half to 13 so far for this Riverside Tiger team. Not to mention the fact that on the last series of penalties, which totaled, as you called, seven yards, it really moved them into position to capitalize on the way to that last touchdown. Well, they're going to kick the ball off again. And <laughs> hey, it caught the ball and kind of tippy-toed like, well, I was out of bounds. Let's get five more on the penalty. And this time he's going to be considered as returning the ball. We've got an injured player. While they do that, Bruce, you can reach for your handy-dandy calculator there because up to tonight, the Hornets had 732 yards in penalties in 67 efforts, and that comes out to an average of 10.93 yards per penalty, and those are big penalties. Those are, let's try it one other way. What I was driving at was 732 yards in penalties divided by eight. Well, in, now, that, we're going, now we're going to game. That's 91 and a half yards a game, but and the other way. We have 67 yards in penalties for the Hornets now, and there's still four minutes and 15 seconds left in the first half. The other stat's interesting, too, because you've got over 10 yards per penalty. There you see the next home game, November 18th, 7 p.m., Sat Fullerton versus the Saddleback team here at Fullerton District Stadium. But In Injured player, briefly, was Scott Elmore, one of their defensive backs, but he is apparently okay. To go back to your other thing, 10.9 yards in penalties. Those are not little mental mistakes, procedure calls, things like that. Those are things, big discipline mistakes you can't keep making. First and 10 for the Hornets at their own 21, 415 left in the first half. Andrew is the ball carrier, and as he goes by the line of scrimmage, he is uh, tripped up from there and we've got a little uh, discussion about activity. various people's ancestry and things down there. And one of the uh, Hornet linemen was wise enough to kind of back away, feeling that he could have been tagged well, again for another one. Not to mention the fact that he might get tagged with Pete Tuiasa Sopo, and he's 265, and the penalty might be the least of what you got from Tuiasa Sopo. He is a large person indeed. If it was basketball, we'd call him a wide body. The gain of two by Anders, second and eight. Rolling to his right, David Chisholm, and he'll do it himself. He's got almost enough for the first down, but not quite. He'll put it down at about the 30 and a half yard line, and they needed to get to the 31. This should be third and less than a yard. 
Chisholm looked real good there. That time he had time. He rolled out. He couldn't find a receiver. He had good field vision, and he looked at the field real well, saw the running room. Take a look here. He looks the whole field over. He looks the receivers. There's nowhere to go. He tucks the ball, and he goes upfield, and smartly he goes right across before he gets tackled. He did a great job looking, for, looking upfield. Hal Sherbick must have done a great job with this young man because, frankly, he really looked disheartened a week ago, and he has more poise in this game tonight than he has had all season. Ball to Andrews, flags everywhere. Well, you know, you come off a game like we saw last week at the Santa Ana Bowl, and that's the time to really come into a game like this where you're playing the number one team in the conference, and you got to suck it up. you got to come back in here, and you've got to look like a good football team. Offside, defense, first down. Well, there's a great gift for the Hornets after what's been going on. The crowd kind of collectively took a deep breath when things happened there. And they'll take five yards on the offsides by Riverside. And frankly, I don't think there were 12 people in the stadium who thought that penalty was against Riverside. First and 10 for the Hornets at their own 35, two and a half left. I'm sure they'd love to launch one and get them away with some points now. But still, 7-3 to three to a team like this coming in 8-0 is not bad. And Chisholm looks terrific tonight. Chisholm again on his own. He will do it his own. He'll get hit at the 37 and dragged down there by Kenny Deemer. And they may spot him to the 38. That would give him three more. At that time, Chisholm, although he did a good job of running the ball, he didn't look upfield. He didn't have that field vision that he needs to have. And deep, deep down the well, field he looked up, but when he, when he looked, nobody was open. By the time that Wilford was open, he had too many Tigers in the neighborhood to stick around. But in, in all honesty, Bruce is bringing up a good point. We noticed this last week is that vision at a great length down the field has been a problem at times, which is a little bit surprising for a 6-2 quarterback. Yeah. But keep in mind, you don't, uh, you don't get this hobby down overnight. In and out of the hands of Coons. Looked like a juggler at the 49-yard line, and Rob could not hang on to it. As you said, it's been a problem so far. Chisholm needs that time. If he's under pressure, he'll either try to go with the ball himself or eat it. He won't hang in there long enough to wait to see if there's somebody open. There was deep. a flag on this, and we didn't see it, honestly. And it looks like it's going to be offsides defense. again at Riverside. Another break for the Hornets. So, scratch the incomplete pass, scratch what we thought was going to be third down, and we end up with another five-yard gain by the Hornets on another offsides by RCC. Second one on this drive. Second, and it's going to be about two, well, let's call it three, to be honest, from the Hornet 42-yard line. Chisholm looks downfield this time, and he's got Nelson open. And Richard Nelson spins and fights his way all the way down to the 33, maybe even the 32-yard line of Riverside. That was what he tried to do before. What he didn't have last time was blocking. More and more it becomes clearly evident how critical the blocking for David Chisholm is. He rolled out that time. He had great protection. They formed a pocket around him to where he was able to roll out, stay tight, throw the ball, find D Richard Nelson. And that time he did what he tried to do before. 19-yard gain on what has been, frankly, a little bit of a weird drive. First and 10 now for the Hornets, and they'll take it at the Tigers' 33-yard line. They're still time with exactly a minute left in the half. At least they could get within field goal range. Swing pass to Haydick, back through the seam, and he almost got there, but he tried to run through two very large people, and strangely enough, one of them paid the price. One was linebacker Mike Harrington, the leading tackler in the conference, and if you can believe this, Nick John Haydick at 180 pounds just just decked Pete Tuiasa Sopo, who stands and weighs 6'1, 265. Here's a swing Watch pass. Watch this. Bang. Bang. Right into it. Well, actually, he hit Harrington. I don't know who hit Tuiasa Sopo. Tuiasa Sopo, at worst case, ran into Harrington. Somebody did it. I'll and tell we you got what. a Hornet player injured as well, but this was.
was farther away. Tui Asasopo got up awfully slow, but better than that, the Hornets only have one timeout left. There, the ball is on the uh, Tiger 25-yard line. There's 47 seconds left in the half, and they would have been forced to maybe call a timeout there had they not gotten an injury on the Tiger team. And I think that injury, Bruce, might be Nick John Hadick. Well, if it is, that'll hurt him. And we believe it is Nick John Hadick. Yes, Nothing it is. real serious, but he's going to fit. Of course, if you ran into a 265-pound nose guard and a 205-pound conference-leading linebacker, you might uh, feel it for a while, too. And that, that's helps you. that helps you, because he's going to come out anyway and shuttle a play in, and that was a timeout that you didn't have to call, and you only got one left in the half. You got a great point there. 45 as they start the clock going. Chisholm with one back and double wideouts, but you need Haydick at a time like this. Chisholm's got a whole schoolyard to throw from. W outstanding blocking by the offensive line. The intended receivers that time, well, there's actually two of them. Joaquin Garcia, who's almost, if maybe not quicker, then Haydick was down there, and the wide receiver Chuck Wilford. And maybe more important than the fact that the pass was incomplete is the fact that it stopped the clock. Now probably we'll be looking for... My guess is if Andrews come in, they may do a little play to Andrews and then call a timeout or something over the middle of the tight end. Haydick comes back in and Garcia goes out. So maybe going back to the air. Line of scrimmage is spotted at about the 25 and a half yard line. Well, actually the nose of the ball now on the 25 for Riverside. This will bring up third and three for the Hornets, that is, on the Riverside 25 yard line. And we've got delay of the game. Hello. Boy. Here, you can hear the crowd reacting to that one. They are not pleased about that. So the penalty totals that we're keeping track of, they may not be taking notes in the stands, but the Hornet loyal are apparently aware of what's going on as well. And this will move the ball from the 25 back out to the Tiger 30 with 34 seconds left. Third and nearly eight yards. Nelson in motion. Chisholm facing a four-man rush, just gets the ball away to Nelson. Nelson inside the 30, inside the 25. The ball's loose and there's a flag. There. If it's a clip against the Hornets, the Tigers will keep the ball. Coming up with it is Brian Dodson. And let's just stay tuned and say we'll give the ball to Riverside. It must have been a penalty against the Tigers. Here's the ref. Clip, clipping against the Hornets. Declined. Fumble recovered again by Brian Dodson. Now, I don't know if that we have the replay of that or not, but whoever made the, whoever came in there and knocked that ball out of his hands did it from behind him. The whole time he played that ball, and I missed who it was, to be honest with you. He came up and I saw him do it. He absolutely just nailed the arm of the ball carrier and caused the fumble. This is Payne going to one of his favorite receivers down the far sideline, but the ball will be knocked out of the hands by Ron Williams. Chucky Bibbs back defending for the Hornets. So Richard Nelson catches the ball, and then he catches the wrath of the Tigers and gives up the ball, but at least on that play, it did not come back to bite him, and the Hornets at this point trailing by four with 21 seconds remaining. Well, you never Randy want to go Payne have... sets his line and he's a 6'3", 210 pounder. Delay handoff up the middle and it looks like the Tigers are going to be pleased to take a four point lead into the locker room. Daryl McChristian on that carry from the 22. Clocks at 10 seconds and they don't look like they're in any hurry at all. Well, you never want to go into halftime down by anything but for the Hornets a well played half defensively and you've got to be happy to stay in there after 72 yards of penalties in the half to only be down by four to the number one team. You got to be pretty happy about that. Well, they're going to take a break and talk about it. We'll take a break and we'll be back to talk about it. You're watching Fullerton College Hornet football on your local cable station. And there's the score at halftime. We'll be back in a little bit.
back at Fullerton District Stadium. The halftime activities are just about wrapped up. And the Hornets and the Riverside City College Tigers in a very good Mission Conference matchup with only a 7-3 score at the end of the first 30 minutes of play. And there you see a Hornet of the future down there practicing field goals, which is about the only thing offensively the Hornets did in the first half. They had a 34-yarder by Eric Lang. And a four-yard touchdown turned in by one of the Riverside City College Tigers, Mark Wilson. But I suppose that the, the story, Bruce Newmark, in the first half, while the Tigers normally average 133 yards rushing for a whole ball game, it's the yardage on the ground that was taken away. Absolutely. Fullerton having a lot of problems tonight so far with the penalty. In the first They're averaging 91 and a half point, uh, yards penalized per game. Already in this half, they've been penalized for 72 yards, and not just small things. They've been penalized for unsportsmanlike conduct. One of them on a scoring drive right down inside the 10-yard line. A couple other unsportsmanlike conduct penalties and two motion penalties on succeeding downs. You know, there's the old saying of what goes around comes around, and while the yardage that the Hornets have been tallying has been taken away by the officials, conversely, the Hornets have turned around and taken away from the Tigers, a team that averages 410 per contest. Well, they ought to have 200-plus yards in this half, from the first half, from what they've done so far on their first possession. Fullerton held them to only a 19-yard gain. The second possession, a net loss of three yards. The third possession, a, a gain of only one yard. And then, of course, on that fourth drive, the 67-yard uh, drive leading to the four-yard touchdown run by Wilson. So you're talking about 85 yards in total offense in the first half for the Tigers. And this is a team that we mentioned uh, with the 410-yard average per game is fourth in the conference. But I don't know if they have played a team with the caliber of the defense of the Hornets. And speaking of caliber, if you just joined us in our first half, we put a graphic up on the screen about our next game here at Fullerton District Stadium. We hope you can make your plans to be here for it when the Hornets take on the Gauchos of Saddleback. We've said they're a football factory in the past, having a disastrous year this year where they're only one and seven. However, while this game is taking place, they are playing the Dons of Rancho Santiago that slept the Hornets around 35 to 10 a week ago at the half in Mission Viejo. The Gauchos lead Rancho Santiago 14 to 7. If they win there and the Hornets win here, it will be a street fight the rest of the way in the Mission Conference. The second half of this battle gets underway from the 20 yard line for Riverside City College. Will Martin bringing the ball back, and he didn't bring it back very far. Mark, the, the Hornets have got 116 yards offense total during the course of the first half. You add the 72 yards in penalties to it. Had they been able to put those in forward motion, they could have a dramatically different half. My feeling is they're lucky to be only down by four points. They are lucky, and it could dumb down to the kicking game, and both teams have outstanding kickers, so we'll have to wait and see. Right up the middle, we talked about the quick open type of offense on this option that Riverside has, and there you see a big game gained by Daryl McChristian, busting it from the 20 all the way out to the Tigers' 47-yard line, a gain of 27 yards. And he's closing in on a lot of records. You go back seven, eight years ago, while yours truly was covering Tiger ball games, there was a fellow by the name of Tony Cherry who went on to the University of Oregon. And tonight, possibly, Daryl McChristian could break several of Cherry's records. If he carries the ball 39 times tonight, and he's already got about 18 or 19 in the first half, he would break that record, and he's also going after career rushing. One more time, it'll be McChristian. Well, they tried to stop him at the line. The Adams and DeClark tried to shut him down. They couldn't. He broke through the line and finally was brought down by Mahi Lavea. Well, he went from one 47-yard line to the other 47-yard line. That adds up to a gain of six that time for McChristian. And it becomes a second and four from the Hornets 47. Just one minute transpired so far in the third. The Tigers seven, the Hornets three, and the fog is beginning to roll in here at Fullerton District Stadium. Reverse pivot and give the ball again to McChristian off the right side of an enormous Tiger line. Averages 263 pounds, and that time the big guys in front pushed enough Hornets out of the way that 
McChristian could gain five more. Well, he ran over Mitch Meyer's side right there. Uh, Terry Angle blocking on Mitch Meyer. Terry Angle for the Tigers, 6'2", 250. Mitch Meyer, 6'2", 250. Kind of like looking in a mirror across the line there. <laughs> small against small. Everybody else on the Tiger line is bigger than that. It was good for five. They only needed four. That means another first down. Hornets show like they might be blitzing. Somebody got underneath the, the blocking in a hurry. The tackle made by Mitch Meyer. He went right under the block of Jason Downs, and I think you probably would do the same thing. Jason Downs, 6'2", 280. All of a sudden, there's fog rolling into this stadium that looks like somebody's pumping a smoke machine into it. There's fog coming in from everywhere. Now, we are in the northern end of the city of Fullerton, kind of right near Brea, and we are looking in a northerly direction and not more than 10 seconds ago you may start to see it on your screen now it's just as if somebody took this big blanket and rolled it right over uh, the grandstands and visibility is going to become a real adventure here that pass intended for Ron Williams and Bruce you know if if the fog were to become a problem it might be more to the Hornets advantage because up till now the only thing that's really worked has been the passing game for the Tigers well the passing game for the Tigers worked of course they do effectively work out of that option and tonight Andrews hasn't been particularly effective running Chisholm has been able to go to the air that's most of the offense that they've gotten although the passes that he has completed have primarily been short outs. It's a third and eight from the Hornets 39 yard line. Payne to pass. It's a screen this time off the hands of McChristian. He could feel the footsteps of Orlando Robbins coming and unable to come up with the ball. I'll tell you, to go back to the fog, you're starting to see it a little bit on your screen, and now it's into the entire stadium. In less than 90 seconds, the fog rolled into this stadium, and the temperature now, has there, dramatically dropped. You can feel a chill in the air. As a matter of fact, when this started about a minute or two ago, I literally thought we might have had a fire in a building behind us, and you, you, everybody stood up and took a, a deep breath to see if it was smoke, but it's not. There goes the kick up in the air, and you'll just have to wait for it to come down, and Nick John Hadick may be the bravest man in Orange County. He made a fair catch. And it's beginning to look not like Fullerton District Stadium, but more like Wembley. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it's amazing how quickly it came in here. And as I said, it, it has actually dropped the temperature in the stadium. Yes. You can actually feel a chill in the air in your chest and your nose. And it's not stopping. It's coming in from our, what I guess would be the south side. And it's rolling in through the stadium across the grandstands. And that could change this contest. 12.30 in the third quarter. Pitch back to Jeff Andrews. He's got one block, he's got two, and he trips over his own lineman and goes down at the 20-yard line. He made a cut up the field and went right over the ankles of Joe Hayes and went down there. They'll spot the ball right at the 20-yard line, so it'll be a gain of three for Jeff Andrews. Now, if this continues, we are probably 10 minutes away from the fog literally becoming a factor in the ball game. We're about we, two minutes away from the binoculars not being our, any good. Our press box is even with the back row of the stands, and we already lost the ball on that punt a moment ago, and it was a very clear night up till now. This is Richard Nelson. He took the pass in from... Excuse me, Rob Coons. Oh, well, they are congratulating yeah. Nelson. All right, he went down on the asphalt there. Yeah, no, the you're right. Line. It, was it was Richard Nelson from, from the 20-yard line. Take a look here on the replay. But this is the thing that's worked tonight. We talked a minute ago how the fog could affect this game. There you see Chisholm with a lot of time. The rollout, there it is, number 88, Richard Nelson. But the factor is that the, the plays that have worked have been the short routes. They're a little shot over the middle. They could keep doing that in the fog. Gain of 27 yards that time. Give the ball and an end around to Mike Thomas, and frankly, the defense didn't see it. You can't see anything. From here, you can barely see the field. And from the defense being 10 yards away from Thomas in the backfield, they couldn't see the exchange handoff. Now there you can see what's really becoming the story of the third quarter. And we are going to have to write this in big letters. This started about five minutes right after the, the third quarter kickoff. You remember the, the uh, Philadelphia-Chicago game a few years ago where Mike Ditka said this year he was ordering in the fog. You wonder if Hal Sherbeck may have rolled in a fog machine. 
Well, it went from the 47 of the Hornets to the 47 of Riverside. Andrews with the ball, and he'll stop at the 50-yard line. So let's recap for a moment. He's going to be called with his knee down about the 49-yard line. Okay. All right, so what we had here after the Nelson play, which was to the Hornets of 47. Then we had the run of six yards by Thomas. And then a loss of three, and now on this play, Andrews has lost one more. So it's third and eight from the Hornet 49 yard line, and the pass, I believe, is intercepted, and it was. It was intercepted by number 20, Scott Elmore. Scott Elmore, and it went through the hands of the intended receiver, Richard Nelson, and he took a shot from, I believe it was Kenny Deemer, and uh, lost the ability to get the ball. It was tipped back. Take another look. There's the, that's that rollout pass again over the middle. The ball goes through his hands. He actually touches the ball, and coming up with it was Scott Elmore. 10-18 left in the third, and welcome to what is becoming a very interesting ball game on a Saturday night here in Orange County. Give the ball in, off into the haze goes Daryl McChristian. McChristian moved the ball from the Riverside 34-yard line. Depending upon the spot, they're going to put it at about the 36-37 yard line. Give them credit for three, second and seven from the Tigers 37 yard line. Boy, this is quite an experience. This is the first time I've ever been in one of these with this much fog and this is really wild. I have heard of this type of thing happening and I have been to games like this, but uh, as you say, it's the first time for calling one. And up the middle, from the 40, there's a fumble, and the Hornets come up with it, and Dante Venturelli is the man with the ball. I believe it was McChristian who lost it. He's still on the turf, and they're going to say the ground caused the fumble, and even with the fog, we don't agree with that one. Well, Venturelli's coming up with that ball, and he says, this is mine. You know, when they had the fog ball at Soldier Field afterwards, a lot of people kind of got on Vern Lundquist's case with CBS for making too much of it, but we are only maybe a half to a third as far off the field as he was, and frankly, the fog isn't here as bad yet as well, it was there. And you don't but, really see it there looking into the stands because the camera that there. did that was in the stands. So they're gonna say the fumble was after an advance. There's the pass coming into view, and boy, that is, would have been a major league catch if it had been held onto by Cameron Lyman. Pass was in incomplete. It was a gain of three to back up for a second by McChristian, and he fumbled, but he recovered it. That was a gutsy call on that play because nobody could see that ball, including the intended receiver. That's one of those where he says, I'm gonna throw the ball to the left side toward the sideline. I'm gonna heat that you get there and try to come up with the ball. The problem with that is that a lot of those kind of passes can be intercepted. Well, there was a penalty flag on that, Bruce, and we'll have to wait and see what he has to say. For obvious reasons, we didn't catch the flag. And as we're looking at our monitors here in the broadcast booth, they don't look any different to us than what we're actually seeing in real life before us. Fourth and four from the 40. Uh, we can show you who's going to kick the ball, and we'll show you who's waiting at the other end. The punter is Darren Goodman. The receiver is Nick John Hadick. Take my word for it. The snap is back. The ball is kicked, and it's actually a low snap. Hadick will field it at the 32 and be brought down at the 35. So we've got a three-yard punt return by Nick John. Boy, I tell you, trying to field a punt against guys as big as he's facing is one thing, but that's something else. The punt was good for only 18 yards. Eight forty-four remaining in the third. Hornets ball, first and 10 at their own 35-yard line. 
you know, they say in this sport, it's the idea of hit them where they ain't and outsmart the other team. Keep them guessing, <laughs> and Mother Nature suddenly becomes a factor. Jeff Andrews from his own 35 out to the 44-yard line, gain of nine. The problem here is that it makes a fake really, really effective because those linebackers can't read what's happening in the ball, and if you sell that fake good enough, the, the pass could be complete or the running back can make it through the line because everybody doesn't know where to be. You got a good point there. Play action takes on a whole new meaning. The Hornets and the Tigers have been doing this kind of stuff since way back in 1921. It's gotten to the point the series is so long at 23-17-1 in favor of the Hornets that they now rate each school by who won what decade. The 80s have belonged to the Hornets. And they're fading off in the distance goes Jeff Andrews, one man to beat. And the last guy left brought him down, and we're going to have to wait a moment until he comes back into view. It was John Ramirez on the stop. Finally took him out of bounds. Tell you, these fog lights on my binoculars are working great. Well, Ramirez, the leading tackler in the conference, apparently could do it even with his eyes closed. And the ball moves from the Hornets' 44-yard line down to the 30, so it's a 26-yard run by Andrews. There you see Jeff Andrews running around the left side as he goes off into Never Never Land. 7.42, Mark Elmer along with Bruce Newmark. If you just joined us, welcome to Fog Bowl 2. Vern Lundquist, I understand, wherever you are. Seven and a half left in the third. We can still see the scoreboard, and it's seven to three. The Hornets trailing the Riverside City College Tigers by a score of seven to three. Now Andrews again, the ball carrier. Sherbeck, Coach Sherbeck now not trying to do any gadget plays and just trying to hold on to the ball and run good, solid, fundamental football because you don't want to throw the ball here where you can't see the receiver and maybe throw an interception with Andrews as good a runner as he is this may be a good shot to pick up a touchdown. You know it's a funny thing the first half was really fascinating because the Hornets stopped the Tigers David Chisholm looked the best he's looked all season and it really wasn't the running game of Jeff Andrews no. or the, the option offense running game of the Tigers. Now we take on a whole new vein of what do you do under adverse conditions Chisholm launches it into the end zone, and the re signal by the official is the pass was overthrown. I believe the intended receiver was Mike Thomas, and there's an injured ball player down in the end zone for he Riverside, hit. and he's holding a right knee. I think he hit the curb. He went all the way out. That's right. You could be right, Bruce. John there Ramirez. Is. It's John Ramirez, and they went all the way oh to the boy. end of the end zone, and as he slid toward the track, he may have hit his knee on the, uh, on the curb, and Ramirez, the leading interceptor in this team, first in the conference. He's tied for the conference lead with Orlando Robbins of the Hornets, and I think you're right. I think right, you're right, Bruce. I saw this happen once in an RCC game a few years ago when they played East Los Angeles College, and at that time it was a Tiger's helmet that went into the curb. So... This could have multiple meanings in multiple ways. Meanwhile, play will continue. Third and seven, or third and eight, if you will, from the Tiger 28-yard line. And Chisholm apparently not afraid to throw. The visibility for them, frankly, may be better than it looks to us down here, or up here, I should say, as the, versus the players down on the field. We are looking down through the fog, and of course, we're higher up in it than they are. And this, frankly, is not what you would call a big stadium for junior college standards. And we've got a flag out there somewhere. Here's the story. Referee Lloyd Nixon looking for the switch, and he didn't find it, but we got procedure against the Hornets. It was third and eight from the 28. This will back it up and make it third and 13. Got to tell you a funny story. Before the game, when I walked up to Coach Sherbeck, I mentioned what a beautiful night it was and how nice the weather was. And here we are all the way into November, and we didn't need sweaters or jackets or anything, and usually you'd expect to need them. And all of a sudden, as the temperatures dropped here, we could use a barca. Chisholm, he's got his man, and it's the biggest target in the fog, Rob Coons. Even the PA announcer's wrong on that one because I know how tall Coons is and there's no way that that was Richard Nelson. Let's take a look at who it was on the right side of the field there. The 
Rob Coons is standing out at the 45-yard line as they get ready to spot the ball, and they're discussing first down. Well, that's the third motion penalty oh, now so they got far. A, that's it. There's another flag on the Hornets. Here's the story. All right, this time it's going to be holding, so that's going to back it up even more. And this is what Bruce was talking about. We had 72 yards in penalties against the Hornets when the second half began, and now they've added at least 15 more to it, five and now 10 more for holding, or approximately 10. The line of scrimmage was the 33-34. They back it up now to the 44, and we end up with third and 23 at the Tigers' 44-yard line, 5.57 in the third, and it's a four-point ball game, which normally wouldn't seem like a big deal, but it might be a big deal with the way the Hornets are playing now. We got a man in motion. Rob Coons, the big tight end, squatted at the line of scrimmage. They're probably going to consider that motion, and the fog has lifted a little on the playing field. This time, it's delay of game, and this is really getting out of hand. Even the fans here are aware of how many times the Tigers are the victim of the laundry. Well, on this series right here, there was a five-yard motion penalty. It's actually on this down. There was a five-yard motion penalty, then the 10-yard holding penalty, and now a five yard delay of game. They're at 92 yards penalties in this game so far and moving backwards a lot faster than they ought to be. Third and 28 from the Riverside 49 yard line. Chisholm launches it for multiple reasons. Wilford, the intended receiver, he can't get the ball and neither can Fred Easter who's back defending. Wilford did a very good job. The pass was underthrown. He turned to try to come back to the ball. Easter was right there, and he took Easter out of an interception play. Well, pardon me for the pun, but around every bank of fog, there may be a silver lining here. The good thing about this is that with this punt, the Hornets might be able to back the Tigers right up to their front porch. There, there you saw it. Wilford replacing Easter as the uh, deep secondary man. Fourth and 28 at the Tigers' 49-yard line. The kick's away, and it'll be marked out of bounds at the 19-yard line of Riverside City College. Five fourteen remaining in the third. You see the Fullerton Hornet team. Time for the defense to go back to work here. They're going to spot it at the 19-yard line, so no return on the punt. The Tigers will take off from there with a four-point advantage. McChristian takes the ball. Looks like the stop was made that time by Mike DeClark from the 19. It's very strange. They'll give him credit for four yards on that play. Strange as the fog rolled in initially, it went directly down onto the field. Now it's lifted a little bit, and the fog that's coming in now is staying up a lot higher. That may uh, help both teams a little bit, not to mention us. 4:45 remaining in the third. Double tight end, split backs. The Hornets show blitz, and the Tigers counter to the blitz by quickly giving the ball one more time to Daryl McChristian. I think it was Keone Malingus that was getting ready to blitz that time. And he came in off what would be the right guard for the Tigers, and they gave the ball to McChristian off the left guard. Levea and Orlando Robbins in on that stop. When you blitz on your right, you're fine. But remember, you're taking a player away from his assigned spot. And if a Christian had cut back then, it could have been a problem. Line of scrimmage, the 27. They gave him four more on that one. Third and two. Kevin Capps in hot pursuit of the ball carrier, who this time was James Johnston out of Morris Knoll High School in New Jersey. 
And he will move the ball from the 27-yard line, I believe, across the 30. Yes, they will spot it at the 31. So it's another gain of four yards, and that's enough for a first down, well, first and 10. It was almost more than that. The Hornets jumped off sides early and got back in time to avoid the encroachment. But again, they've got to be careful. They don't need any more penalties. 338, 37, 36, counting down in the third. Right up the middle again, and it should be McChristian with the ball. And it is McChristian. Four more, so four plays in a row, and on each one of them, a gain of four. Second and six, Tigers from their own 35-yard line. There's a good look at the trenches. And you see Randy Payne set that double tight end line, and quickly, one more time, they give it right into the line. This time, the ball carrier is Mark Wilson, and he's thrown back immediately. And the last guy getting off of him is Mike DeClark. Now, Wilson's a 185-pound freshman. Mike DeClark's 230, so you can guess who won that war. And there's Wilson going, he's a lot bigger than I am. Somebody else can carry the ball next time. They were at the 35, and after the meeting with Mike DeClark, the ball is now on the 32-yard line. Loss of three. And that'll bring up a third and nine at the Tigers' 32-yard line. Split backs, tight end on both sides of the line, and double wideouts. Coming up on just two minutes left in the third. And who has the ball? Guess what? Down the field, wide open. And the touchdown scored by Riverside by Cameron Lyman. Unbelievable. They lost everybody. Including the two of us, to yep. be absolutely I honest. I was absolutely sure that that ball, you talk about a fake from Payne to Gary Adams. He faked the world. He, I thought he kicked that ball back. Let's see if we can take a look and I find out like how it happened. I would like to request the replay. This is Here a we see. Oh, there it is. Gary Adams threw the ball. It was a pitch back to Gary Adams. Gary Adams from the backfield passes the ball to Cameron Lyons. We apologize for missing that, but again, the fog, a little bit of the story here tonight. It was on the far side of the field, and uh, we just simply didn't see it. In the replay, we thank the guys for a great camera shot there. And that was a 68-yard fake, <laughs> and it worked. The extra point attempt by Darren Goodman, and there's a flag. Now that is not the first time this year that Goodman has thrown a ball. They must have tried this once before because he has one pass attempt from earlier in the year. It was offsides against the Tigers. The extra point in its effort at least was good. And with 2.09 remaining in the third quarter, it is now Riverside 14 and the Hornets 7. It's a total of six plays, 81 yards, and three minutes, and four seconds. Two oh nine remaining in the third quarter, and frankly, not the game that we expected. Almost no offense in the first half to speak of for by either team. A total of only 10 points by two teams that for a game average, if you added their two game averages together, almost 60 points. And here we are now with the third quarter almost shot. We've only seen a total of 17 points. Back from his six is Nick John Hadick, and he will bring it out to the 29. So Haydick, a 23-yard kickoff return. And with 2.02 left in the third, you go from the Hornets' desire to generate something to the fact that they absolutely need to now. This does not look like it's going to be a 40-38 to 38 football game. And suddenly, an 11-point deficit is beginning to look like quite a lot. First and 10 for them from their own 28-yard line as the official backed the spot up one yard from what we told you. Chisholm will give it to the only running back 
in that set this time, and that's not Jeff Andrews getting off off the pile. That time it was Tony Goulet. Goulet moving it from the 28 to just about the 35 yard line. And my question to you, Mr. Newmark, as we get a good look at Tony Goulet, now what? You're getting penalized. The passing game is I like there I, at times. I like going back over the middle. It's worked every time. They go to Nelson. They go to Mike Thomas and Rob Coons. I like that short out into the flat to those guys. You can't go deep because of the fog, and it's been effective all night long. The key is getting Chisholm the coverage. Second and three from the Hornet 35. They go to Goulet again. Plus, the other thing is we looked early in the year at how many different receivers that Coach Sherbeck has used. I think at one time we figured there were 10 or 11 different receivers. And when you have that many guys with good hands, you've got Thomas, Wilford, Coons, Nelson. You can go to Nick John Hadick or Joaquin Garcia. And to me, I would think right now with Chisholm, if you can get him the time, you want to go to a short out pass into the flat or right over the middle to the tight end. Goulet did not get anything on that. He will come out of the backfield. Now he comes back in, and I'm beginning to wonder, where is Jeff Andrews? Nelson's in there. They run double tight ends on third and four. Thomas in motion. Chisholm on a seven-step, maybe more drop. They dares the short one over the middle. Bruce was talking about Richard Nelson with the ball, and he got the first down to the 40, so a little five-yard pass play, and if it'll work, why not? See, that's been working so far. The other thing you had was the fact that Mike Thomas went wide out to the left, and it gave him an option. It gave him the option to go to the deep, to the uh, to the left side of the field or over the middle, and that's something that Chisholm needs. He needs several different places to go because once he gets time, he can complete the pass. Earlier in the telecast, I told you the Hornets had a total of 12 different receivers with a pass reception average of 10 yards or more. I was wrong. They have 13 different guys that hold that average. And then they've got about six or seven more on top of that that have at least caught a ball. There's one of them, and that's Rob Coons. He's down to the 43-yard line of Riverside as you hear the gun ending the third quarter, and he is one of many in double figures. Coons' average is 11.2 yards per reception that time he got 16. There's the score at the end of three. The Tigers leading the Hornets by 11. We'll be back with more Hornet football after this timeout. 15 minutes more showing on the clock. We're about to get underway with the fourth quarter of the Riverside City College Tigers visiting the Fullerton College Hornets. Well, we started seeing it right there. There were two series, two plays right there over the middle to the tight end, and I expect to see a lot more of that. That's maybe why you're not going to see a lot of Jeff Andrews except to keep the passing game honest because they need two touchdowns just to get ahead of this team. Well, they started to bring Andrews in before that last play, which ended the third quarter, and I believe he went back out. No, he did not carry the ball. I was going to say... He came in, and then it looked like he went back out. Don Norris was the ball carrier that time, another ball player out of Western High School, and he got one. So it's second and nine from the Tiger 42-yard line. Well, Andrews was in just before the end of the third quarter for that last play. You are right about that. He was the man to whom they faked the ball and then made the completion to Rob Coons. Chisholm may be audibleizing here. Haydick, no, that's going to be Garcia in motion. Chisholm will roll to the right. Beautiful screen set up to Nelson. He'll go around one potential tackler and advance the ball down to the Riverside 34-yard line. So again, that short, controlled passing game, and they get eight more. Franklin Means for the Riverside Tigers was blocked excellently by Ward Van Pelt that time, and Richard Nelson, had he, had Van Pelt not blocked him, Nelson would not have been able to make that reception. Wilford and Nelson come out, which means that Rob Coons has gone back in. I formation once again, Goulet and Andrews in the backfield. Thomas, one of the wide receivers. Joaquin Garcia was the other, and they go back to Jeff Andrews. He advances the ball from the 34 down to close to the 32 yard line. Gain of two, second and eight at the Tigers 32 yard line. Mark Elmer along with Bruce Newmark and our Fullerton College Media Services sports crew. Glad you could be with us for what's been a 
mysterious night here at the district well, stadium. Even more mysterious, that's now caught, being called first down. Well, that's because it should be. It was second and two, make that third and two, and they got two and they needed it. Double reverse there. Jeff Andrews kicks the ball to Haydick. Haydick across and stays in bounds, and they're gonna call Haydick down at the 11-yard line. Well, it was a first and 10, Bruce. You were absolutely right. And Haydick advances it from the 32. They're gonna back him up a little bit to the 12. So it's a gain of 20 yards on the double take, reverse. Take a look at this replay. Great job, Jeff Andrews on the reverse to Nick John Haydick. There it goes to Andrews. You, okay, then there's a handoff back there on the right side of your screen. You didn't see Haydick. Look how he stays in bounds there. He just dances right inside the sidelines and goes out at the 12-yard line. Boy, did he make a great move on that potential tackler in the backfield. 13 minutes left in the game. Hornets down by 11 and trying to do something about it. Chisholm reverse pivots, gives the ball to Don Norris, and I think he made it to the 10, so that would be good for a yard. But he may have paid the price. Somebody is down on the field, and I think it may be Don Norris. He left his feet and went up into the air, and as he ran into a blocker, he was knocked back a total of four yards, and boy, he went down hard. I think this is where stomach meets immovable object, namely you. head of opponent tackler, so he leapt leapt from the 14-yard line and went up heavy into the air, got about the 11-yard line, sustained a block. I'd like to see the replay if possibly the guys in the truck say they have it. I want to thank our crew, Steve in the truck, and the guys for doing a great job, not only camera angles, but having replays. And about tonight. three of our camera people tonight are ladies, so that's men and women. There you see, he goes up in the air there and takes a block, really quite a hit. And it's Well, the helmet that he met was that of Riverside's Samila Manu, and I remember that name oh, from Riverside so Poly High School, 6'1", 225 pounds. And here comes Norris off the truck, <laughs> feeling like he got hit by a truck. <laughs> that, may have, that may have been <laughs> that a Freudian have, slip. That's one of the more accurate Freudian slips of all time. And Bill Chambers, the trainee, is going to go over and... Or the trainer. And explain trainer that. Or the trainee. Well, he's going to be... And you have a point there. Bill Chambers is the trainer. <laughs> And Norris is about to be the trainee at 12.30, and I will plug on in spite of everything. Second and eight from the 10, Chisholm rolls to his right. The receiver is open, and he can see him. Touchdown to big Rob Coons for the Hornets. There you see number 89, Rob Kuhn, six foot two, 235 freshman making the touchdown there, a touchdown that was badly needed by the Fullerton Hornets. It takes a score to 14 to nine, and the play that I was hoping we were gonna see more of tonight was that, that pass over the middle. Chisholm there with a lot of time, rolled right, looked for the man over the middle, completed the pass, put the touchdown on the board. Tracy Garrett, the backup quarterback and holder for the place kick, calls for timeout, and they may talk about a two-point uh, attempt here. If they get two, it would make it 14 and to 11 and pull them within a field goal of tying the ball game. And guess what? They're going for two. Andrews back in. Haydick back in. Mike Thomas back in. The drive started. 2.02 left in the third quarter back on the Hornets 28 yard line and they've marched 72 yards down the field since then. In 10 plays over a four minute and 40 second span. And now they're trying to pull within three and this might be a good move. You always wonder about two-point conversions. When they're right, they're great. But well, if they don't, they're going to be five points yeah, down. And yeah, but it doesn't matter longer. anyway because you need a touchdown to get ahead, and a field goal would still leave you one point behind. So since you need the touchdown anyway, this point after doesn't matter. If you miss it, you still need a touchdown. A touchdown give you 15. You'd go out 15-14 if they don't score again. Well, the offensive line holds its hands for unity, and... 
The assistant coaches for Riverside City College hold on and just hope for the best. Thomas shifts over into the slot to the top of the screen. Andrews down into a wing position. Triple wideouts, fake to Andrews. Chisholm's running out of time, and he's going to run out of real estate. He cannot break the tackle. He's hit first by Kenny Deemer and then by Mike Harrington, and the two-point PAT is for naught. 12-22 in the fourth, and RCC still leads the Hornets 14-9. Well, other than obviously the two points, had they gotten it there, it would have been 11. The field goal, all you would have had would have been a tie. There you see David Chisholm, who has done really a superb job tonight after a dismal performance down at Rancho Santiago. It is the best he has looked all year. Well, 12.22 left. And along with the fact that the offense of the Hornets has stumbled, and it really hasn't been because of the Tigers' defense. Although Riverside City College's defense in itself is uh, something to be aware of, they only rank seventh in the conference, so they're not that bad either. But it's really when the Hornets have misfired, they have taken any offensive threat away by themselves. Just a quick note on David Chisholm. After the game he had down at Rancho Sonic, well, let's go into that in a minute. Kickoff from the five-yard line and bringing it back for Riverside from the five to the 20 will be a ball player that I don't believe we have listed on our roster right here. We'll make sure of that. In the fog, it looked like number 48. It was number 49, Brian McCurdy. Okay, well, I was hoping it was 49, but I wasn't sure. What I was going to say about David Chisholm, Mark, was the fact that he had a terrible game at Rancho Santiago. They got blown out 35-10. He was pulled in the fourth quarter, and I was watching him on the binoculars, and he was sitting on his helmet. He looked really dejected. To come in here tonight and play as excellently as he has played, the mental toughness involved in that is commendable. Well, I mentioned it in the first half. How about the coaching of Hal Sherbick and his staff this week to get him back in the frame of mind to face the number two team in the state and number four in the nation. Meanwhile, play resumes from the 20. McChristian from there for Riverside. And he gets a yard if he's lucky. Well, I'll give him credit for one. And it's second and nine for the Tigers from their 21-yard line. And there is part of that huge offensive line. Strangely enough, the guards wear numbers in the 70s and the tackles wear numbers in the 50s, which for those of you that do some coaching is completely out of the norm, and yet it's not due to injuries. That's just what they do. But Barry Meyer's been unconventional in a lot of ways, so... Randy Payne carries the ball from what was maybe the 21-yard line. Dante Venturelli, you'll hear that name a lot, out of Catella High School, making the stop for the Hornets. And the ball is marked at the 29, so the scoreboard will give him credit for nine. We'll give him credit for eight. And now a big test for the defense of the Hornets. Big, they need to stop this third down. Big down, 11-0-5 left in the game, and if they could stop him here, it would really help. There's the fake, there's the pitch back to McChristian, and he will get the first down and a whole lot more. Out of bounds at the 45. Brought down once again by Dante Venturelli, and it was a fake handoff. And then a pitch back to Daryl McChristian on a delay, and McChristian with a big gain. We need to find out how many carries McChristian's got. He must be getting close to the total number for the night. Take a look here. There's the fake going through the line, a pitch back to McChristian. Little delay there. Stutter steps around a defender and goes across to the 50-yard line. What was the 46-yard line, I'm sorry. A gain of 17 that time by McChristian. 23 carries so far, so that's not enough for the Riverside record for most in a season yet. And they'll give it inside to James Johnson from the 46 to the 49. Although the carry's not the only thing happening here tonight, there's a possibility that there's another record on the line. I believe he needed 141 total yards. He might be closer to that than the carries. Well, we'll check on that in a moment and find out. Second and seven at the Tigers' 49-yard line. They had a four-yard run by Mark Wilson that we saw without fog and a 68-yard touchdown pass play that we missed, but you saw at home when Gary Adams launched it down the field to Cameron Lyman, and that's really all the Tigers have needed. There's that reverse pivot again by Randy Payne. He keeps the ball himself and busts his way across the 50-yard line. 
over the 45 and down to nearly the 42 of the Hornets who have left one behind down on the turf. And this is not somebody you want to lose. Defensive tackle Mike DeClark is down at the 47 and has not gotten up. And of course the touchdown that put the Tigers ahead solidly ahead at that point 14 to 3 was a big play which was the worst nightmare of the Fullerton coaching staff was that he came into this game tonight trying not to yield any big plays. It'll be a first and 10 in Hornet territory at the 43 yard line when play resumes but down there in the bottom left hand corner of your screen you can see Hal Sherbick and several of the training staff including the trainer Bill Chambers walking off the field with Mike DeClark and it does not look serious and when you got a big guy like that you do not want to lose him. He's only a freshman too so at 6'3", 230 and maybe what 18, 19 years old he may still be growing and that's one you want back for 1990. 9.58 left in the ball game the Hornets trailing 14 to 9 if they could get it back here but Look this out. may settle the tail right here the leading rusher in the conference rushes all the way down the field from 43 yards out touchdown Tigers and class may have been dismissed with that one Well, he came into the game tonight for Riverside City College, 164 carries, 1,285 yards. And in those 164 carries, he only lost 18 yards the whole season, 7.8 yards a carry, and you just saw touchdown number 10. Right after the kick, we'll take a look at the replay on the touchdown. Back to kick is Darren Goodman. The score now 20 to with 9.45 to go, the kick is up, and it's signaled as good. A few moments ago, Bruce Newmark was wondering whether Daryl McChristian was getting close to the single season rushing record set by Tony Cherry back in the 1981 season. With that play, he just broke it. We'll take a look at the record breaking touchdown run right there, 43 yards. McChristian, nothing fancy, right over the center of the defensive line into the end zone, touchdown. 80 yard drive. It took him a total of six plays and only two minutes and 27 seconds. And it's RCC 21 and the Hornets nine. And now the Hornets are in tough territory right here. They're down by 12, 9.45 to go in the fourth quarter and they really need the offensive line blocking. There you see Coach Sherbeck who's Definitely the wheels are turning on how you pick up the points you need to win this game. And you got to really go back to the air again. You got to get the blocking for Chisholm, but it's tough with the fog. You got 9.45 left, Bruce, and Chisholm looks better tonight than he's ever looked. If you could strike quickly, the fog is not as bad now as it was before. And remember, that may not be as bad for the players as it looks to you at home and to those of us at the top of the stadium. This will help right here. Joaquin Garcia from the five, and he can fly. He cuts back in at the 25-yard line, still on his feet, and fighting his way to the 30-yard line. And the guy trying to drag him down with as much force as possible is Anthony Cawthon, a 6'3", 226-pound linebacker. And Cawthon out of Teaneck, New Jersey High School. Boy, he had a long bus ride to get to Riverside. Let me tell you about Teaneck, New Jersey. That is one of the absolute toughest cities in all of New Jersey. You know, and if you come out of Teaneck, you are a tough hombre. You know, that's one thing I always was fascinated about by Barry, about Barry Meyer is that he would get more out-of-state ballplayers for J.C. play than anybody I had ever seen. 9.38 left in the game as that play starts off for the Hornets. And getting up off the pile will be Jeff Andrews. He moves it from the Hornet 28-yard line to about the 35, just short of the 35. And there's a player down for... Um, the Tigers, and it's Scott Elmore, one of their safeties. Well, I grew up back in the uh, New York, New Jersey area, and I can tell you, in Teaneck, New Jersey, you don't call anybody any names or somebody hands you your uh, your teeth for breakfast. That's a tough area, and a guy that comes out of Teaneck, New Jersey that played football is a bad, bad guy. You know, and that's something that, that Barry Meyer was always able to do. He'd get players out of New Jersey. He'd get them from New York. He'd get them from a lot of East Coast cities, and frankly, I didn't know how he found out about it because there's so many 
good JCs between the West Coast and the East. Of course, half of like all the JCs in the land are in California, but they've got some great ones in ten in uh, in Texas and some other good ones in Kansas. And it was really kind of a surprise to see that happen. Gain of six that time by Andrews Chisholm to throw right now. He's got a man open, and it's Nelson. And you want to talk about major league pass defense? You see Richard Nelson meeting John Ramirez. And it was Ouch. an absolute perfect defensive play. Ramirez was in perfect position. He read the play. He watched the receiver. He was facing the pass. The minute that Nelson was making the reception, he gave a shot. And boy, that was a tough thing Take to Take a watch. look at this. It's absolute textbook deep secondary defense. There's, watch this. There's the Chisholm pass. with enough time, too, again. Bang. Ouch. Boy, that one's he he'll be feeling that one again in a films Tuesday. It will now bring up a third and four. Chisholm looking downfield. He's better do it himself. He did not cross the line of scrimmage. The pass is intended for Haydick. And I think there I might have pulled it in and gone for it and got the first down before anything else. No, I think that you're absolutely right. That would have been a one time that Chisholm could have run to the sideline. He had clear running to the first down marker at the sideline. I think he was a little concerned about having stepped across the line of scrimmage. He let that ball go somewhat tentatively. Well, that brings up a fourth and four from the Hornets, 34, and they cannot afford to get risky here. So they're gonna have to bring on Lang one more time. And meanwhile, waiting back to bring it back for Riverside is Will Martin. Line of scrimmage, the 34. And the clock shows 8.55 left. High into the foggy night. Signal for the fair catch and taken at the 31 yard line by Warren. It'll be a 35 yard punt, no return. Well, they've relied on the defense quite often at Fullerton College, and they're going to need to do it again. But even now, it may not be enough. We had mentioned in the first half, normally when you allow a team to go on a long, sustained drive, you'd say, well, that's not good. It wears out your defense. And yet, tonight, in the first half, there was like a six-minute drive by Riverside. It may have been the best thing that could have happened because it prevented the big play. But there you see how Sherbuck, who's got to be concerned, because Riverside gets the ball again, first and 10, at their own 31. And guess who gets the ball? McChristian. And guess who makes the stop? Hornets, Dante Venturelli. And that helped. Loss of six. Well, the Hornets only have punted three times tonight. They punted one, well, four times tonight. They punted twice in the first quarter, only once in the third quarter, and now once in the fourth quarter. So they've been able to move the ball tonight, although they haven't been able to score. Well, there you see Barry Meyer. Doesn't look terribly pleased on that last play, and he has a few words of uh, what you might call encouragement for uh, James Johnson about, you know, the guys in the other jersey, you're supposed to knock them down. 8-10 left. Payne. Play action, look out, launch the pass. There's the receiver, wide open, Cameron Lyman. And he can fly and will all the way down to the Hornet 37-yard line. Orlando Robbins finally comes in there to make the stop, grabs him up on the top of his shoulder pads and slams him down to the ground. But he, Lyman actually bobbled the ball and it was bouncing. He turned up field. Take a look at the way he turns up field before he's actually got position of the ball. We had a little technical difficulty there. But he had the ball in his hands. He turned up field and he about lost it. And he had to pull it back in to turn up field and make the 37-yard make the game. A few moments ago, the Hornets were down by five and they looked like they had a shot. A 43-yard run by McChristian and now a 38 yard pass by Lyman and the verdict may be in on the Hornets against the Tigers. Great tackle there by Kevin Caps with help by Mahi Lavia. Caps got him low and Lavia got him high and the man that got nailed was McChristian. First and 10 it had been on the 37 yard line of the Tigers or excuse me of the Hornets and McChristian may have, well they'll give him credit for two. Second and eight. It'll be from the Hornets' 35-yard line this time. And the biggest enemy of all right now is that time mix up on the scoreboard counting down at seven minutes exactly. And the fog's going from south to north, and the wind is blowing from east to west. Figure that one out. McChristian gets a belly fake. Payne will follow him through the hole. Another Barry Meyer trademark. And the ball goes down to the 28-yard line. A gain of seven more. Third and one from the Hornets. 
27. Fullerton with only two timeouts left. They used one timeout already in this half. Well, with what's going on as this game is being played in Mission Viejo, the Saddleback Gauchos, who are normally good but have been terrible in 89, may be surprising Rancho Santiago. You have to wonder what next week's ball game will be like as well when the Gauchos come into Fullerton District Stadium to take on the Hornets. And those two schools go back a long way together. The story of the first half we talked about was penalties. 72 yards during the first during the first half for Fullerton, but yet they were able to move the ball and stay in the ball game. This half now, only 20 yards in penalties, but unlucky for the Hornets, offensively they've begun to stall. Well, they needed a yard and they got it, and I believe it was McChristian that was the ball carrier that time. 550 remaining in the ball game. It was McChristian. We've confirmed that. There he goes again, and inside the 25. And there you see a major league double team by Jason Downs and Curtis May, and you can understand what they did. The both of them double teamed Mahi Lavia, the left inside linebacker, to blow him out of the hole where McChristian was going. Lavia weighs 220. Collectively, when you add together Curtis May and Jason Downs, they together weigh 540 pounds. Needless to say, Lavia moved out of the way. Second and nine from the Hornets 25. Payne pitches to McChristian. He had a 43 yard touchdown a moment ago, much in that neck of the woods right there, but not this time. He's slowed down by Keone Malingus and then Orlando Robbins and Eddie Knapper in the neighborhood. That's been a troublesome play so far tonight for the defense of the Hornets. That pitch back to McChristian has played havoc with their defense tonight. Now that was what you might call for McChristian a busted play. He still gained five. Third and four from the Hornets 20. And taking their own sweet time, the Tigers slowly walk up to the line and are on their way to walk into a 9-0 record for the 1989 season. Right now, I'd have to give the nod to El Camino, and the two of them could meet in a bowl game for the national championship. Pass is intercepted for the Hornets at the goal line and brought back from there by Chucky Bibbs out of the cornerback position. 412. Is there or isn't there? Well, I was just going to say, you know, just before he took that snap, I was going to say if they can stop him from scoring here, there's 412. If you run the air game effectively, there's a shot. Take a look at the replay. There's a pass from Payne. Intercepted right at the goal line by Bibbs, and then he stopped by the intended receiver. But with 412 to go, there's time. You're only two touchdowns down. If they'd scored there, it would have been lights out. Well, they're down 21 to 9. The scenario is 412, and they're 95 yards away from what would be the first of the comeback TDs. Chisholm was going to pass, drop back. I should say was going to pass, step forward, drop back again. And on his second drop back of a single play, he completes it to Mike Thomas, and the ball moves from the five-yard line out to the 30. That was not only a big play, but what a great job the line did of keeping him covered because he took a lot of time in there, and plus for him, he hung right in there. Well, we just passed the four-minute mark left of the ball game. Hornets from the 30-yard line. Chisholm took a snap, went back two feet, looked like he was going to go forward, literally walked right into the pit between the two lines where he could have been sacked right at the goal line. That didn't work, and he dropped back and threw a 25-yard pass. Dropped back in the pocket this time. He's got time. Thomas right over the middle. One receiver against two tacklers. Now it's three, four, and five, and Thomas is brought down at the 35-yard line. Gain of five more. Clock counting down at three and a half. I got to wonder why they're taking so much time, why they're not maybe sending in two plays at a time. Oh, I think they probably have done that. They're being signaled from the sidelines. But and if I remember right, the Hornets the only middle. have one timeout left. I believe they have two timeouts left. I believe they took one on the, uh, Tracy Garrett took one in the fourth quarter, and I don't think they called a timeout in the third quarter. 3.05 left. That's just not enough time to get it done. Chisholm now, though, swings it out on the far side. I think that's Richard Nelson from the 35. He loses the ball when he hits. It came out before he hit the ground at the 38, but I think they're going to say his knee was down. Another three-yard pass. 
Time ticking away now. You're inside the three minute mark, inside the two and three quarter minute mark, and they're just taking an awful lot of time to get these plays on the field. Well, it's a young team, and that's something else that they'll have to be reminded of by that guy and his staff in the days, weeks, and no doubt months to come for some of them. A pass of seven yards on that, I said three, it gives them a second and three. Ball up the middle. Jeff Andrews with it. We talked to Coach Sherbeck prior to the game and we're talking about what it is to be a JC coach. You talk about a young team, the difference between a young team and an old team in junior college, only a year. Gotta be one of the toughest jobs in coaching. There you see Barry Meyer. First and 10 from the 40. Attempt on the far side to Nick John Hadick. The ruling is he did make the reception at the 47-yard line. Gain of seven by Nick John Hadick on the pass from Chisholm. You know, even in high school, coaches get four years with players in a program. And, Mark, I can't even imagine how tough it would be. Well, it is, you know, but in defense of that, something else, too, you got to keep in mind with Victor Williams uh, last year and his brother before that, Hal Sherbick actually had those players for three years because each one of them redshirted, but even that is a rarity in junior college, and it's really tough. You stop to think of, I mean, most kids even in, like, Pop Warner will play for the same coach for three or four years, even if they gain weight. The coach may move up with his team in size and weight and age, and it's, it's a tough deal. That pass is completed to Goulet. From the Hornets 47 to the Tigers 49, another little four yard pass play. And this is what they needed to do and we're on the way to doing until that 43 yard touchdown run by McChristian just about ended it. First and 10. And pass is launched to Nick John Hadick, if that looked like pass interference, it was. The only problem was it occurred out of bounds, no penalty. Well, next it'll be the Gauchos of Saddleback out of Mission Viejo. They'll be here a week from now, and we hope you will be too, and maybe to go along with your viewing of the game in person, or if you are unable to be with us at Fullerton District Stadium, we hope you'll tune in and catch the Hornets in our final regular season telecast of 1989. And uh, hope that you can uh, join us on any one of six or seven cable companies, Multivision or Century, Copley, Comcast, Rogers, throughout the Orange County area for the final telecast of the season. It will be second and 10 with a minute and 47 left after the incompleted pass at the Tigers 49 yard line. In motion goes Eric Robinson. Chisholm with the ball, he'll dodge the umpire. He'll dodge three or four tacklers, and he'll go down at about the 41-yard line of the Tigers, gain of eight for Chisholm, and the clock just keeps on ticking. Chisholm there doing everything he could to try to get out of bounds. He knew he needed to get out of bounds, and Fullerton takes a timeout. When they can continue, it will be third and two from the Tigers' 41-yard line. And there you see David Chisholm getting the congratulations to some of his players and discussing what's going on with Hal Sherbick. In the background, you hear that popular rap tune, Bust a Move, and that's just exactly, I guess, what you could say kind of shut the door on the Hornets because they went to a, a short, controlled passing game. It looked like it was going to do it, and then up stepped the conference's leading rusher, none other than Daryl McChristian, and he literally busted a move of 43 yards for a touchdown and not only put the Tigers comfortably out in control 21 to 9, but he also busted the single season rushing record for the Riverside City College Tigers, which had stood since back in 1981, set by Tony Cherry, who up until about 10 minutes ago was the best runner they ever had at the Inland Empire School. A minute 32 left on the clock. We went from beautiful skies to what looked like downtown London, and now it's just beginning to look like downtown LA after a major traffic jam. It is fog, but it looks like good old air pollution, but it's not. The pass complete from Chisholm to Rob Coons. There's going to be a hanky thrown after the fact. This time, I honestly don't think it's a Hornet at fault, and it should not be holding, but the Tigers think it is.
We'll have to wait to see what the call was. Well, we're waiting now to find out what the referee has to say. It's going to be offensive pass interference. Well, we've seen a little bit of everything else tonight. Why not? As if things weren't going bad enough for the Hornets right now. They're going to back it up, and it's going to be offensive pass interference. Law, minus 15 yards on the penalty. That's problem number one. And they lost the down as well. And Bruce, I think you have, a, as they say, an important program announcement yes. after this play. Fourth and two, a minute 20 left. Thomas in motion. Chisholm back to pass. Swings it out to Jeff Andrews. And Andrews will advance it down to the Tigers' 45-yard line. And as I said, it was pass interference against the Hornets that caused that problem. But they may be in for even more next week. Mr. Newmark? Well, it's 28-24 in favor of the uh, Saddleback team down at Rancho Santiago right now with one minute left in the game. They're not at Rancho Santiago. They are at home at Saddleback in Mission Viejo. So the home field advantage is usually good for about three points. And right now it's good for four. Nobody in JC football believed that a Ken Swearingen team could be as bad as one and seven. You just knew that somebody, somewhere, somehow, was going to get bushwhacked by the Gauchos, and it might be the Dons. And Payne will take the snap for Riverside and put his knee down. The drive, if you will, started at a minute 11 left. The line of scrimmage was the 45-yard line for Riverside. And he will step back from there and take a two-yard loss and make it second and 12 from the Tigers' 43-yard line. And there you see a team that I'm sure is going to be heard from again. They're ranked number two in the state and number four in the country. And we got a couple of the Riverside assistants standing outside of our booth. And I won't talk to them about this now, but between these guys and El Camino, El Camino, I would say, is the best team we've seen so far. Riverside had some uh, tough times tonight, but a 21 to nine game here is more to what the Hornets did to themselves than what was done to them until late in that fourth quarter when McChristian ran the 43-yard play, but it was the thing of putting McChristian in a position to well, put lights out when it's 7-3. to three. And that's the thing. That Hunt, coming into this game, the big play was the thing they didn't want to yield tonight after yielding four big plays down at Rancho Santiago. And ultimately, it was the big play that turned the lights out for not, the Hornets tonight. And it was also the lack of the big yardage. They averaged 133 yards rushing, and they gave 72 of it back in the first half just in penalties. Randy Payne will get maybe a yard, and the clock is exactly at one minute. That'll make it third and 11 from the Tigers' 44-yard line. <laughs> 45 seconds left in the ball game, and the clock counting down. Well, all he's got to do now is go to the line, put his knee down one more time, and players can go to the field and shake hands and say goodbye. You know, it's been a tough thing, but you kind of have to wonder about where this team's going to be in the future. I think they just flat got beat by better athletes when they played El Camino. That's an outstanding school. You play Riverside, or, uh, Rancho Santiago, and you just plain got outplayed. Tonight, it was an issue of really, if you will, beating call yourself. beating yourself. I think you might as well say it. So you get into a scenario where you've got a young team with a lot of talent who quite literally has taken their lumps. Although this is only my second year with Fullerton College, I would say this may be where Fullerton was two years ago before they were the runners-up for the national championship in 1988. This is not a lot of fun now, but they could be really a force to be reckoned with in 1990. And they're not through yet either. Payne puts his knee down with 15 seconds left. And the celebration begins for the Tigers, who are about to go 9-0. and
and time has expired to make it official. And we understand just as the gun sounds here, there apparently was a late game touchdown scored by Rancho Santiago, and they have beaten Saddleback 31 to 28. So that kind of tells the tale here and there. And next week, that team down there in Mission Viejo will be up here to take on the Hornets at Fullerton District Stadium. For Bruce Newmark, I'm Mark Helmer, and on behalf of Fullerton College Media Services, we were glad you could be with us tonight for some JC football, and we hope that we'll all get to do it again one week from now. The final score once again from Fullerton District Stadium, the Hornets bow to the number two ranked team in the state, the Riverside City College Tigers, 21 to nine. Good night, everybody.